This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, it's some interesting stories around today, not least a, a growing sense that this government, and quite possibly the next one, um, in the, I think, fairly likely scenario that the next government <laughs> is made up of people different from the current government, I think that there might be a genuine attempt to get to get a, a, a kind of metaphorical genie back in the metaphorical bottle. I speak of teenagers with smartphones. And I'm reminded of 1983 when I remember telling my late father that I was the only kid or almost the only kid in my class who didn't have a mini motorbike. Um, my father was uh, unconvinced. I think it's fair to say he, he, he was. In fact, you know, I can actually remember the name of the lad in my class who did have a mini motorbike. That there was only one, and I was so. Maybe this is where my petrol head gene withered and died. I was so jealous. I can't. I could not imagine at the age of eleven or twelve. I couldn't imagine anything more exciting or more glamorous than having a mini motorbike. Admittedly, the lad who had one lived on a farm. So there were plenty of places he could have ride it. I think riding it up and down Hercot Road in Kidderminster would not only have been quite dangerous, but also illegal. But but if you say to your dad now that you're the only kid in your class who hasn't got a smartphone, the chances are that you're pretty close to telling the truth. And that that's why I think it is... Uh uh, a potentially fascinating, absolutely fascinating issue for a whole heap of reasons. And and I'll tell you who's played a big role in this, a huge part in this, is Esther Jai, the magnificent mother of Brianna Jai, the um, girl whose, uh, uh, whose murder really transfixed the nation in uh, uh, the most remarkable way. And Brianna Jai, of course, was a, was a trans girl, a transgender teenager. And it is two transgender issues that we turn our attention first this morning with the publication today of the CAS report into uh, the treatment of children who are questioning their gender. Language is very important or unsure perhaps about their gender. Language is incredibly important in this issue. And, and, And for that reason, we will begin with words. And I think the word that we should begin with is toxicity. It is, it is hard to imagine, actually, a more um, ringing vindication, if you like, and I, and I appreciate the dangers of, of using that word, but a more ringing vindication of those of us who have refused to engage in the vituperative attacks that both sides, and, and I think today we can perhaps use that word with some confidence, the vituperative attacks that both sides have inflicted upon each other. I don't think we've ever addressed the issue of puberty blockers on this program, except from, I think, perhaps a very long time ago, a factual perspective, an explanatory perspective. And and part of the reason for that is that you can see some, or you could, if you were being honest, see some wisdom on both sides. Um, in, in, In short, the idea of administering life-changing, body-changing chemicals to children who are unsure of their gender identity is quite arresting. You think, no, that you should wait until they're older. If you don't want to think particularly deeply about this issue, you could even invent an age now at which you would introduce a blanket ban on all gender treatments, all puberty blockers until that age. And I can, I, I mean, that's not an untempting position because the chemical, the biological impact of puberty blockers is so profound. But the other explanation, which I think we perhaps did touch on on air, the other explanation is, of course, the postponement of puberty blockers sees the body of the child change more than it otherwise would, which means that if they then pursue life as a transgender adult they are dealing with issues that would not have been in place had the puberty blockers been administered earlier. And there, for the uh, umpteenth time, for the umpteenth time, is an illustration of why this is such a difficult territory to explore. If you need another example, then how about this? Who, Who really is qualified to contribute to this conversation except people who 
started transitioning when they were young, even arguably, because the focus of the report is, I think, understandably on um, uh, 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 puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. The only people really relevant to this conversation, I think, are the people who've had it or the families of the people who've had it. And, and then you're left with a question of statistics, which, which seems grim, but is there evidence that an overwhelming majority of children who've had this treatment regret it? Or do we pay far too much attention because of, I think, the toxicity of the debate or the way in which some of the media vested interests have um, stuck their colours to a mast from a very early stage? Do we just focus too heavily upon the, I think, relatively small proportion of people who regret having had this treatment? There's one in particular who'd have been recently released from a, a, a mental health hospital, from, a, from psychiatric care, and who was then fast-tracked down a path of um, puberty blockers, which I think to anybody on the outside, you would think, whoa... Whoa. So, I mean, the inquiries must be conducted by paediatricians, and they have been. That, that, that's exactly what um, uh, Hilary Cass is. But the people of whom you are asking questions about what has happened, what will happen, and what should happen in the future, you would think would be focused on the people who have experienced the treatment. And that seems to me to be pretty much what she has done. Uh, and... I can't see a clear way through that. You know that NHS England has already um, banned puberty blockers uh, and switched to a new holistic model of care in which under 18s experiencing confusion will receive psychological support rather than medical intervention. So, so they've put the limit at 18, which opens the door to some of the problems that I've just discussed. The, the, I, I think part of the issue, and in fact, I, I wonder as I get older whether the most toxic territory is the territory where certainty is hardest. If certainty is really hard and you know in your waters, you know in your bones that certainty is close to impossible, something about humanity makes us double down on our own faux certainty. And that, I think, is part of the reason why the conversation displays the toxicity that Hilary Cass describes, I think, so powerfully. I, I mean, it's actually heartbreaking to read elements of her conclusion and then go online and see people proving her point in spectacular fashion within minutes of the words being published. The toxicity, we'll look again at some of those words regarding toxicity in just a second. And the question I think I'm poised to ask you, albeit that there'll be plenty of room to um, uh, a, a examine, if you like, the... The reality of lived experience. I think the question that, that all of us are have a have a have an interest in answering is 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 why why so toxic? Why has it become such a toxic conversation? And and I think part of the answer is we don't like uns we don't like uncertainty. I don't like uncertainty. This uh, I, I, along with the Middle East, oddly is probably in the top two topics that I find hardest to address because I like to have firm opinions. I like to have strong views. If I've got a strong view, I don't mind if I upset you. If I've done the work, I've done the thinking, I don't mind if I upset you. I used to mind a bit, I, 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 but you, you, you develop confidence in your own convictions. And yet when we turn our attention to this, I do mind if I upset you because I don't have really concrete opinions for the, I mean just two of the reasons that I've already just demonstrated to you that the tension between providing medical intervention too early versus the tension in providing it too late and you will know if you have paid even the blindest bit of attention to this program over the last few years you do know that I generally steer clear of it for another reason which we can ignore today given the national nature of this report so we can ignore this today and that is that it is a relatively disproportionate number of people that affect that are affected by this for, for the whole of society to take an interest in something that affects such a tiny amount of people is not in and of itself a bad thing but it is if you like a confusing thing for many of us. E even 
when I watch the switchboard for other programs at this station, that you can sometimes get a shortish queue, usually of men who've got no personal investment or interest in this issue whatsoever, queuing up to talk about it. But apart from that, it is not of interest to people who don't have, and and excuse my language, who don't have any skin in the game. You either have passionate vitriol, or you have... Honest confusion bordering on lethargy. I had nothing to do with me. It doesn't affect. And and then, as you're, if you have children of a certain age, the likelihood of them having friends or even perhaps going down a path of gender confusion themselves has increased exponentially over the years. But that's what happens when conversations become more public. That's what happens when stigma is removed. And and so there are, in no particular order. A bunch of reasons why this conversation is historically difficult. But apart from my brief flirtation with the notion of of being almost um, uncertainty phobic, humans finding it really difficult to admit nuance or grey areas. And, and, you know, I get that toxicity directed at me when I say that. When I, if I historically say, or I have said in the past... A bit pompous. I don't think I've said anything historic. Uh, so if I say, and I have said in the past, that in, in many of the crucial questions at the heart of this conversation, I can see both sides, that, oddly, enrages everybody. You probably invite more abuse as a public figure by refusing to pick a side than you do by picking a side. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, there are levels of being a public figure. I don't think anybody has um, received as much comment in this uh, territory as, as, as J.K. Rowling, for example, has, much of which is pretty hideous. But there'll be plenty of people who think her contribution to the conversation has been hideous. To step back and say, I'm not sure about bits of it, I'm not sure about elements of it, is to light both fireworks it's to light the blue touch paper on both sides of the divide which i think perhaps is why i haven't found it very fruitful or 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 informative in the past but today that's what we've got to do today we've got that's what we've got to do i will keep an eye on my text but they are moving so quickly already this morning that it will be difficult for me to uh uh, to, to, to be completely democratic, if you like. But I'll read you this, this, this particular paragraph first, all right? The toxicity of the debate is perpetuated by adults, and that itself is unfair to the children who are caught in the middle of it. The children are being used as a football, and this is a group that we should be showing more compassion to. Now, when I coined the phrase footballification to describe an inability to admit that your own side could ever be remotely wrong and the, or that the other side could ever be remotely right, I wasn't thinking of this issue. But it is, as I've just alluded to, it is among the best imaginable examples of what the phenomenon of footballification seeks to convey and it is i'm sure it's a coincidence that that hillary cass has deployed football as the um analogy for for her dissection of the debate but goodness me the phrase that i use about having your football scarf your red scarf or your blue scarf tied so tightly around your neck that it's cut off the flow of blood to your brain has never been more pertinent has it it's i mean it's 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 the most perfect illustration of what i try to describe when i talk about footballification i usually talk about corner kicks on the television when you see the vicious hatred on the face of fans being directed at a player kicking a ball in a different colored shirt from the ones that they're wearing and the adulation that they reserve for the people wearing the right colored shirts and the speed with which their allegiances will swift if will switch if the player changes teams and swaps shirts it's insane and and i love football it's a come on you reds it's insane but it's it's and and it's why she uses football as the example in this context part of the problem now of course is that very few people listening to this will think that they are the 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 contorted face football fan spitting venom and hatred at the person who has the audacity to wear a different colored shirt but you might well be because if you've engaged in this debate at all you've probably perpetuated some of the toxicity that hillary cast describes unless of course you've tried to do what i do which is to say you're sometimes both as bad as each other
And then everybody hates you. But hey, that's my cross to bear, not yours. So here's the question. Here's the question. Why? Why is this conversation, which affects and concerns so few of us, and that's relevant in particular to the treatment of children with uh, gender confusion, it affects and concerns so few of us, why is it so toxic? Why is the debate so toxic? Why is it so hard for so many to see that this, in the words of Hilary Cass, is unfair to the children who are caught in the middle of it? The children are being used as a football, and this is a group that we should be showing more compassion to. Why is it so toxic? 03456060973. And if you recognize a bit of yourself in her description, if, if you are somebody um, already perhaps sharpening your blades, uh, baring your teeth, you perhaps could even be angry with this incredibly measured and well thought out introduction, why do you think you are so, let's not say toxic because most toxic people probably don't think they're toxic. But why, are, why do you think you are so passionate about this issue, given that it affects you personally, or even your children personally, not one jot? Because that's probably the thing that still confuses me the most. 0345 is the number you need. It's 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 10. And uh, perhaps one element as well that needs to be added to the mix before we open up the phone lines is, is that the, the evidence isn't there. Another of the points that Hillary Cass makes is that the both, quotes sides, end quotes, claim to have support for their position, but neither of them do because the evidence isn't, isn't there. This is an area of remarkably weak evidence, she writes in a 398-page report that I don't imagine anybody has read yet. Yet results of studies are exaggerated or misrepresented by people on all sides of the debate to support their viewpoint. The reality is that we have no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions to manage gender-related distress. Uh, so anyone claiming otherwise, even this morning, anyone giving you numbers or claiming that they, there is statistical evidence to support any given position on this is not just lying, of course, or being ignorant. It's often hard to tell the difference, but contributing wittingly or unwittingly to the toxicity of the debate that Cass describes as being per perpetrated, perpetuated, forgive me, by adults. I mean, won't somebody think of the children? It's such a hackneyed cliche, isn't it? But occasionally it's... Uh, they are the only words that fully fit the um, picture in front of us. 24 minutes after 10 is the time. Kate's in Bishop Stortford to kick things off. Kate, what would you like to say? Um, several things. I'm, I'm the, the parent of a young man with, who is trans, um, and we've been through the journey with the Tavistock from just before there was... He, he became involved with the Tavistock just before there was the exponential rise in okay. girls going there so we've seen the whole thing he's he's on um hormone blockers and now on testosterone as well um how old is he now he is coming up to 20 okay he's coming up to 20 so he's actually left the 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 children's tavistock and is under adult services and and and, and he would have he would have started there or first made contact there at about the age of 11 I presume. Yes. Okay. Yes, but I would say at this point that he has always known that he was wrongly placed in his body. I okay. mean, from the age of about, we first noticed things when he was about three. What did you know? He notice? started. Go on. Um, just his. I mean, this is. I hate saying this because it sounds a bit odd, but <laughs> um, you know, I used to work in a preschool. Yeah. I've seen boys and girls play with all kinds of toys. You try not to um, gender define them or whatever. My son always gravitated to a specific way of being okay. with toys and things. So, you know, he's got an older sister. They both had baby dolls, but he always wanted male baby dolls. Okay. 
his avatars on game things were always male, you know, and and the toys that he selected tended to be generalizing here. Okay, yes, male of course. Type toys, and, and that's something know, that, that that's something that could have ebbed and flowed as the years passed, but it clearly didn't ebb and flow. It, it, it became clearer and clearer that in well, at the time it would have been in her mind's eye, she was a he. Yeah, 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 and that you know to the point where he was getting very distressed at a very young age yeah. because he didn't understand why he couldn't do boys' stuff. I hate. I hate these gender-specific things, but that's yeah, okay. what was coming out of his mouth. And we'd be saying, yes, of course you can, you know, mm. come to football mm. classes, do this, do that. But it was an internal feeling of being in the wrong body. Okay. Um, as far as the medications are concerned, it really, really upsets me quite profoundly when you hear people sort of saying that as a parent you're not thinking about your child because it's so untrue my husband and i well it's untrue it's untrue in your case okay but basically you know we were really not happy about our son going on to hormone blockers we weren't happy about him going on to testosterone but we recognised that it wasn't about how we felt about it and what we wanted in the situation we had to do things because he was so profoundly distressed. Yeah. So profoundly distressed. It was that or the fear of losing your child. I mean, he left school at the age of 12 and never went back because his anxieties were so profound. He didn't yeah. even come out of his bedroom for a year and he is not unusual in this. Right. And there are, you know, he does have autism as well. And we always, as parents, have made the connection between the transgender thing and the autism thing. But I also think... Can I have a crack yeah. at explaining what you mean by connection? Because remember, this is a world you know in, in, intimately, and most people listening Sorry. won't know at all. So I think the connection is that because autism can often, well, will usually leave children feeling very out of place, and, and, and that's why it leads to masking and it leads to all sorts of stresses and tensions, or, or, or autistic people look at the world around them and don't recognize themselves very often so uh, the theory is or some thinking suggests that because of that sense of displacement they can rightly or wrongly end up thinking that they are in the wrong body and they would fit in better if they were in a different body have i got that right um, not really that's one way of, <laughs> one way of looking at it yeah oh, i tend to knowing my son i tend to look at it from the point of view of um, and the other trans kids that yes. you know are young people that I've met over time, it tends to be that they are kind of a, a lot more fluid about gender. Just Bearing generally. in mind that gender is a constructed thing; oh, it's not about biology. It's about okay. what's going on in your brain. So you think autism um, makes that an easier notion to grasp than it would be for, for perhaps for other people? Absolutely. Okay, I, that's absolutely. A, that's a, that's and a they're different, more open-minded yeah. about it. Okay, that's what I. That's my personal take. On no, it. I think they're. Um, I think I think they're really helpful to sit alongside each other, and and I get cast now as the skeptic, I suppose. But I was only expressing w- opinions I've heard and opinions that people certainly hold. But but yours is uh, uh, compelling, actually. There were there there is. Uh, I just I I think unless you're actually in a situation, yeah. um, either as a person who is trans or as a parent of somebody that is is trans and is trying to help them along the journey that they have to go on you know it is incredibly difficult to know what the right thing to do is yes i just want my son to be happy and comfortable in his own skin and that's all we've ever wanted um yes and and, and, and what about the idea you, you were i tell you what kate you weren't kidding when you said there was a lot of ground to cover at the beginning of this conversation and, and we're already <laughs> late for the news so in fact what i might do is bring you back after the news is that all right and, and then because because yeah, I, I, I think you're so in the heart of this in in every imaginable way up to and including you, you know being being under the care of the tavistock clinic that it would be foolish not to talk to you for as, as long as we can so you wait there Thomas Watts will do the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, 10.33 is the time. Before we return to Kate, a, a quick word on statistics and, and proof, if you like, that um, Hilary Cass couldn't be more correct when she says this is an area of remarkably weak evidence. 
Uh, results of studies are exaggerated or misrepresented by people on all sides of the debate. When I said earlier that arguably the only statistic that matters in the first instance is the statistic of people who transitioned um, and then regretted it. And quite a few of you sent me the figure of 70%, which I thought was remarkable. Some of you claiming you heard it on LBC. I, 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 that's just nonsense. I, I don't know whether you've misunderstood or whether you've been misinformed, but with Hilary Cass's words in the back of our mind, this is an area of remarkably weak evidence, then you can point at a review of 27 studies involving almost 8,000 teens and adults who had transgender surgeries, mostly in Europe, the US and Canada. And of that number, approximately 1% on average expressed regret, 1%. Now, another study, when you look at people who expressed regret, so if you twin the two studies together, if you look at that 1%, then the most common reason for detransitioning, for wanting to reverse the process, was the realization that their gender dysphoria was related to other issues. And that figure is 70%. So that's 1% of people regretting it, and 70% of the 1% regretting it because they realised that their gender dysphoria was related to other issues. So I'm just addressing that because uh, the figure 70% has been sent to me a bunch of times already this morning. And, and those, as far as I can tell, but as Hilary Cass says, this is an area of remarkably weak evidence. As far as I can tell, that's where perhaps that number had come from. 10.34 is the time. Kate is in Bishop Stortford, the parent of a trans man who first attended the Tavistock at the age of 11 and whose parents wrestled, obviously, with the profound impact that puberty blockers would have on his young life and his young body. But the alternative was, I think it's fair to say, Kate, the alternative was misery. Absolutely, yeah. He was extremely unhappy, suicidal, self-harming, not at school. That's been one of the hardest things to deal with. Mm. Um, and... I can say from knowledge of other parents and, and young people who are in the same kind of situation as my son, there is a pattern that they all seem to follow, which is basically feeling unhappy in themselves for whatever reason. But it's, you know, the trans thing is, is there. Um, and they end up leaving school because they don't feel comfortable there. And they just basically go down a hole really emotionally and psychologically and, and what happened I, what, what happened when 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 treatment started how old was he when medication was first prescribed and 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 and, and what happened how oh, he's sitting next to me here God. um hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> were you 14 or 15 <laughs> yeah i was 13 or 14 i don't know if you heard that yes he i did 13 or 14, or 14. And then he started on um, testosterone when he was 16, I think. 18. Okay, sorry. And um, so, so well, I don't know who to ask first, but I, I'll ask mum. Uh, what, what difference did you notice? What changes did you notice? The, the hormone blockers kind of made him feel safe because obviously at that age, young women start, having puberty and periods and things. So he he was in a situation where he's never had periods. Sorry, Dylan. He hates me talking about his, his previous gender. Yes. Um, so that was a big relief for him, I right. believe. Yeah. And then it seemed to take forever before he was allowed to have testosterone, which is right and proper, actually, from a parental point of view. We wanted to make sure that every avenue was checked and that they, you know, he was really thoroughly investigated psychologically before they yes. put him on this. And it was just like, it was a life changer. He was just immediately happier in himself. What, what, one of know. the things Hilary Cass says is that too many children got stuck on waiting lists and sort of languished there. So your experience... Yeah. I, I, I was actually quite lucky at, at reading massively yes. yeah we, we we came in at exactly the right point everybody that we know that has uh come along after us is has really struggled really struggled and it's because the kids are, are, can't even get on the waiting list for the tavistock most of the time or if they are on the waiting list they have to wait for years um I hear you. I do. It, and that that can be very damaging for them. But I do also, I mean, I think she said that there were um, 
they think there is a connection between autism and yes. uh, well, no, just a dis- 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 disproportionate representation. I don't know that she's gone for cause- causation. Yeah. She's gone for correlation. Yeah, yeah, um, and. I remember the first day that we we attended the Tavistock, we had to fill in a sort of checklist thing. And it was very, because I'd already sort of, I already knew that my son had autism, although he hadn't yet been diagnosed. Yes. Um, But it was very obvious from the checklist that they were questioning that and looking at that okay. in their questions. They were kind of slightly weighted, and I know other people have, have read the same checklist and thought, oh, okay, they're definitely investigating the autism thing. And I also know um, of one of the psychotherapists there that did a paper on it at one point um, and the correlation between transgenderism and autism. And we firmly believe there is a connection. Okay. Certainly in our and, case, and, but... and Well, and you've made a powerful um, uh, case for why that might be. I, I, I'll, I'll finish, if I may, and, and I don't know which one of you, or ideally I suppose both of you might want to answer this. Why, why do you think... It is, and I'm not going to read you some of the messages coming in that are, are, are proof of the toxicity directed personally at you and your son. That, that's um, yeah. that's a them problem. It's not a you problem until I read them out. But why do mm. you think it is such a toxic, a toxic debate? I think, I think I said to your uh, researcher before I came on air. Yeah. I think trans is the new gay. Effectively, you know, the same kind of venom that was probably expressed to gay people when it first became, you know, more... Mainstream. Mainstream in society. Um, You know, it's the same kind of thing. And as my son so rightly said, people, you know, people fear it. They don't understand it, so they fear it. Um, And I think that's where the toxicity comes from, I really do. It's, It's just, we've never encountered this before. It's out of our realm of experience. So let's stick the boot in, basically. And, and, and there will be people who are hopefully poised to offer up a completely different answer to exactly the same question. Would, 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 would your son agree with everything? And I appreciate he doesn't want to come on himself today. Um, he'd, he'd agree with everything you said, I presume. Yes. Yeah. The toxicity. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> not <in>. <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you both actually that's uh, a, a powerful and important beginning to the conversation which is about you and dylan it's not actually about anybody else a- a- except of course the, the the people who may have been treated similarly and do regret it or the people who may have benefited from being treated similarly and as it stands now are less likely to be and and that phrase there that runs through all of this the toxicity of debate is exceptional. It must stop. Not much prospect of that, I'm afraid, glancing at some of the mainstream media this morning and much of the social media. The toxicity of debate is exceptional. It must stop. Because I suppose as, as long as people who deny the reality of what Kate has just described her son going through or her son being it's hard to imagine the toxicity dissipating. And, and just to stress, because some people have managed, including a couple of people on Twitter that normally are a little better than this. I'll read you this one. A sensible, balanced opening to the, quotes trans issue, rather undermined by the last point, James. It only affects a few people. I'm talking about the treatment of children confused about gender. I'm not talking about anything else this morning. Thousands of children unsure of gender identity, Hillary Cass has found, were let down by the NHS. Kate and Dylan's experience, of course, was the opposite. But that doesn't affect a lot of people, and it has nothing to do with safe spaces or transgender toilets or any of those other elements of this debate. It's solely about children and the treatment of children, in every sense of the word treatment, who are unsure of their gender identity. So I'm afraid that my sensible, balanced opening to this conversation was not let down by the observation that the treatment of gender-confused children is something that only affects a tiny minority of the population and a tiny minority of the people engaged in the discourse. 10.42 is the time. Sam's in Southampton. Sam, the toxicity, why? Why do we think? I just think uh, people are just scared of what they don't know, basically. They just don't aren't aware of what, what they see and then they, they read something and uh, are scared of... of of maybe losing losing some of their rights, maybe. 
And yet, the you know the uh, the report that has come out today looks to a shortage of evidence. It describes studies being exaggerated or misrepresented by people on all sides of the debate. You're describing toxicity, I think, directed at transgender people, aren't you? What, I am. What about yeah. the toxicity directed at people who are um, uh, sceptical of transgender? people or well, that's no let me I choose my, no, hang important. on hang on let me choose my words a tiny bit more carefully what about the toxicity directed at people like jk rowling yeah that is that is abhorrent so where does that come from uh from other people who are scared about their 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 rights i guess and their 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 um no, if you if you if you are i mean if you're a feminist you're right to be scared about having your rights taken away you can just look at Roe right. you can look at Roe versus Wade in America something as fundamental to bodily autonomy as abortion legislation got undone thanks to Donald Trump so protecting hard won rights for biological women is is a valid cause and it goes far beyond simple irrational fear of the unknown doesn't it it does it does I've, you know Indeed, it does, James. <laughs> so, so you're just you're, you're you're you're. I mean, you're not clear any more than I'm I am. Clear. I, no. So, I, so, so, so I, I, I think same... we can speculate about where what is sometimes called transphobia comes from, but we can also be pretty clear about where fear of hard won rights and spaces for for um, biological women comes from. But if the conversation is confined exclusively to the care of children questioning their gender identity then your point is more powerful than the counterpoint. And we have why, to why, be very careful, James, don't we? Why, why would anybody be cross with Kate for doing what she did and describing it in the way that she described? Care, concern, exactly. prioritising the mental health and the physical well-being of her child. And it's, uh, Why would you go on that journey if you didn't have care and love for your child? It's yeah. not a simple or straightforward journey, and there's plenty of grief and pain involved, and it's... If my daughter changed her mind and said, actually, I want to be a boy tomorrow, I would celebrate that. But unfortunately, unfortunately, that is not going to happen. And, you know, I, I, I can ask her every day, but it's not going to uh, change the fact of how she feels. Because her I, life would be much easier if she, if she did, if that were to I happen. Would. But it would be like asking her to change colour. Exactly. I have to other the children. I'm not oh. meant to change, change where, the way they were. Um, so, so to, to to ask my daughter to pretend that she's not is also wrong yeah. in my eyes. I, I didn't know you had that personal involvement in the story. Has has has, has your oh, daughter been treated? Been, yeah, yeah. So, with, so my daughter, um, we we first visited the the Tavistock when my daughter was six, right? And that was that was eleven years ago. So she's she's in endocrine. She's on blockers. But, um, you know, it's not... It, we spent years and years speaking to psychologists before we, we were offered any any help other than, than, than verbal. Yes. So, so, so it does seem it's all a political thing. You know, they, um, they released the school guidance a month ago before the CAS report. Why didn't they take note from the CAS report and then release the school guidance? They say, they well, that's say that a political question, isn't it? What What have you heard today? What do you mean? Because I mean, it's two hundred, well, three hundred and ninety-eight pages, but but I've, so far, what, what, go on. Change uh, their mind. I've heard eighty-five percent of them might be gay, right. and, and the, 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 it's. Well, you, you know, haven't heard this from the CAS report, to be fair, Sam. Not from I, the CAS I don't report. know where heard you've heard this, from but, but your radio station. Oh, James. really? OK, yeah, well, so. focusing exclusively on what has what is in the actual report, is it too early for you to either welcome it, it or? It is too early. Okay. It's too early. From, from what, I've, from what I've, I've heard in lots of other reports, it's a huge amount of word soup with not a great deal of action or meaning behind it to be. OK, and, and you've got more skin in the game than, than of course, most people commenting on it or, 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 or reacting to it. Sam, thank you. Um, uh, Amelia Gentleman is, is, is writing in The Guardian today and provides, I think, a helpful pricey of some of the 398 pages. She talks about the review being written in a calmly critical, clinical tone, but there are moments when her anger about how NHS England has cared for a generation of vulnerable children is barely disguised. And yet that anger is not about, or, or, or not exclusively about, or arguably not even about, children being given drugs when they shouldn't have been given drugs. Her, her key beef seems to be with children being left to fend for themselves and not getting the psychological and mental health support 
which you would need before going down a physical treatment path. So I, I think Sam perhaps has a point. The more the more you look at it, um, the, the 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 less anyone can cling to the notion that this provides a neat full stop to some of the conversations and debates that, that unfold around transgender people. She knows, writes Amelia Gentleman, her recommendations will be hugely controversial and that some children waiting for treatment will be dismayed by her conclusions. But she is adamant that she has young people's best interests at heart. We've let them down because the research isn't good enough and we haven't got good data. The toxicity of the debate is perpetuated by adults and that itself is unfair to the children who are caught in the middle of it. It's 10.49. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.52 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC as the conversation continues. The, 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 the central conclusion of Hilary Cass's report is that thousands of vulnerable children questioning their gender identity have been let down by the NHS providing unproven treatments and by the toxicity of the trans debate. Responsibility for the first bit lies with NHS professionals. Responsibility for the second bit in some ways lies with all of us because, uh, you know, even if you haven't engaged in the toxicity of the debate itself, perhaps you could have done um, more to diffuse it. I d I'm not sure you could. That's why I use the word perhaps. Um, the UK's only NHS gender identity development service used puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, which masculinise or feminise people's appearance, despite what Dr Hilary Cass calls remarkably weak evidence that they improve the well-being of young people and concern that they may harm health. So uh, the reason why uh, one commentator writes in The Guardian today about her conclusions uh, arguably representing very, very bad news for young people currently waiting for treatment uh, lies, I think, within that bit of, of, of her findings there. She's a leading consultant paediatrician and she has stressed, and I think some media commentators have elected to gloss over this bit of, of the report, she has stressed that her findings were not in any way intended to undermine the validity of trans identities or challenge people's right to transition. So there is the toxicity. Uh, some people think trans trans issuing is impossible that, 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 that you cannot uh, become a woman if you were born a biological male and yet Hilary Cass has given no support whatsoever to those people despite some of them perhaps predictably already trying to claim some sort of vindication or victory I, when reports like this are published everyone claims vindication Literally, everybody will claim vindication. The more toxic a debate is, the more any intervention sees everybody claim vindication. The only people vindicated, and I would say this, wouldn't I, uh, here today are the ones that have focused more on the toxicity perhaps than on anything else because until you get rid of the toxicity, you're not going to help anyone. 10.54 is the time. Rachel is in Sheffield. Rachel, what would you like to say? Um, I don't really know. Today I'm just kind of sad, to be honest. Tell me why. Um, well, the cash report, the cash report's been going on for like three years, yeah. and everyone's been going. Um, Kimmy Badlock's been going. Oh, this is in the cash report. That's in the cash report. All of my evidence is in the cash report. And then, well, there was the an interim. Report, there was an interim yeah, report. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. There? And now it's come out, and it's come out with all this guidance saying, oh, well, now we can extend this into the adult service. And I'm like, well, the, if you do this to the adult service, it's going to cripple the adult service. Um, because I went through the adult service and the adult service barely coped when it came up with a complex need. So um, I'm kind of terrified, to be honest, for anyone that's actually in the adult service. So um, you're talking about the, and this is the bit that has already come out, um, the, yeah. the, the NHS England shutting um, uh, 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 G GIDS and therefore, yeah. but, and therefore insisting that routinely under 18s will receive psychological support rather than medical intervention which yeah, it, we've already yeah. spoken to two parents this morning for yeah. whose children that would have been in their eyes and there'll always be a billy bunch of numbers on twitter who knows their children better than they do let me just find you well here's one here your callers james demonstrate why the tavistock had to close and why this report is so necessary taking a six-year-old to a gender clinic putting an autistic child on puberty blockers thank goodness this insanity has finally been called out so there's someone who knows these yeah. children better than their own parents and and indeed better than some of the doctors that help but that psychological support rather than medical intervention pushes 
the medical intervention into the adult care system, yeah. which you are describing as inadequate. I think. Yes. So, so right. for example, I went to the Porterbrook Clinic, which yes. is like 25 minutes from my house. They only have two psychiatrists on staff, neither of which are trained in complex psychiatric needs. So when I actually needed complex psychiatric help, the community mental health team in Sheffield said, oh, well, just go to Porterbrook and they'll help you. And then Porterbrook said, we can't deal with this. Go to the community mental health team and end up getting in a year-long argument between the two of them where neither of them would help me. And during that entire time, I didn't get any help from either. And I just got stuck without any help and then had to submit complaints to both clinics. And can you imagine if this happened after this report came out? <laughs> This is why I'm kind of terrified of what the um, CAS report would do to the adult service. Yeah. I, I, and I understand why. I, 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 although I also understand why the, the idea of giving puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones to children, to, to, and the younger you well, are, I understand yeah. why the more concern it, it generates. Yeah, I mean, I'm very, I might be an exception here, but I'm very much the opinion that, like, um, puberty blockers cut off at the Gillick competency at 16. It may just be because of where I work that that seems to be a good cut off, and that. So you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't have them until you're 16. Yeah, so it's the 16. And the Gillick competency, I think, refers to your GP having a responsibility to tell your parents if you want contraception. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I mean, it's 16 seems to be a bit... Um, a helpful age. age. So, yeah, helpful age, a good, a good cut-off, but I understand that's not perfect for everyone. Um, um, but yeah. Um, so your sadness is logistic, isn't it, rather than emotional? You just think this is going to make the situation worse for people like you? Well, well, bearing in mind the fact that like some of the gender identity clinics have got waiting times of excess in 10 years... And you're suddenly asking them, well, oh, you need to do complex mental health support, neurological support. Bear in mind that some of the ADHD and autism clinics also have waiting times of in excess in 10 years. Yeah. Um, and also chromosomal support. I mean, some of those clinics also have waiting times of excess of five years. And their funding is already being strapped because of austerity. And that's unlikely and, to get better anytime soon. And and this, exactly. this this arguably will make that situation worse. Can I ask you as a as a trans woman why you think this debate is so toxic? And if you can, you don't have to, but if you can focus yeah. on the treatment of children unsure of gender identity, which you used to be, why is that element of the conversation so toxic? It's it's people don't understand um, trans people and and for it's a, it's a rehash of a rehash so it's the whole An Anita Bryant thing from the United States think of the children I don't know that and, I don't know oh, it's an, just, Anita just Bryant was a, um, a person from Florida and it was a whole thing from the eight, from the it was the 70s um, okay. and she was just like oh think of the children we can't allow gay people in our schools and stuff like that and then people then did it for the um um um, the gays here and back in the, in the 80s as well and was, I'll think of the children um, but I mean it's just people fear what they don't know and then it doesn't really matter and it could, it could be that there's only five trans people and they'd still do exactly the same thing it's the same with the medical evidence it, they, there's never going to be enough medical evidence for them to accept trans people we could, ju we could find out the exact gene that causes trans people to be trans people and it doesn't, wouldn't really matter mm. Because it's a denial of your reality, or, or yeah, a denial exactly. of your existence. Exactly. It it, it won't but ever it's not, that's not what Hilary Cass has done. She's not denying your existence. She stresses that her findings are not intended, well, it may be she has unintentionally done it in that case, I suppose, to undermine the validity of, of your identity or challenge your right to transition. Yeah, it's, it's all in the nuance. Isn't it? She thinks she yeah. is seeking to improve the care of the fast-growing number yeah. of children and young people with gender-related distress. Yeah, and she's created. She's trying to create a service that's so expensive to run that the Tories just won't ever run it. And what or happens Labour then? Won't ever run it. And what happens then? That no, they all have to be a private service. We'll, we'll have to be shared care with a GP that won't run it because he won't do the GP, won't do the shared care because the G, because the GP can't afford it. 
which is what's happening right now with the with the private gender care clinic. Would you agree with this? For most young people, a medical pathway will not be the best way to manage their gender-related distress. For those young people for whom a medical pathway is clinically indicated, it is not enough to provide this without also addressing wider mental health and or psychosocially challenging problems. Depends. <laughs> you cop out. <laughs> it, it, it depends. I mean, if 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 someone is say autistic and trans, yeah, yes, it makes sense to address the autistic um, part first and then address the trans part second. Yeah. Um, maybe. Okay. Like like for me, because I had a complex mental health issue, it, it made sense to address the complex mental health issue first and then address the trans part second. Um. But that was just me. And, and well, and that does else, sound so. sound pretty similar to, to 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 one element of what Hilary Cass is concluding. Rachel, thank you. I, we may talk again when you've read more of it. I don't know wh- wh- where this conversation is is going. The time now is eleven o two. James O'Brien on LBC. Five minutes after eleven is the time. Uh, there is so much toxicity on all sides. Is something about which most people would agree, but of course, some of the people engaging in the toxicity don't realise they're doing so. I'll show you what I mean, and I'm not a hundred percent sure what quote sides end quotes of this conversation Emma in Edinburgh thinks she's on she says you talk about the toxic debate but what there is is one side that's refused to debate and do any research and another side saying please look at this this is not normal that's toxic (laughs) I mean whichever way you're putting it you're saying one side's got all the right on their side and the other side's got none which is kind of the definition of what Hilary Cass is talking about when she describes children as being used as a football a few of you reminding me of uh he's like a sort of unflushable Lump, isn't he, Lee Anderson? He's he, he sort of somehow in a relatively short period of time, his weapons-grade idiocy has managed to infect so many different levels of public discourse because he, of course, let me just check something with the producer. Is he still in the Reform UK party this week? Is he still there as far as we know at the moment? Yeah, we're, we're confident about this? Yeah, he's still in Reform. Uh, Ex-Labour, councillor, of course, ex-Conservative deputy chairman, currently a member of... Reform UK, although they're hemorrhaging members so quickly at the moment for, for sort of base racism, homophobia and all the other things that used to beset UKIP. Um, it, it, you have to keep, keep, keep tabs on these, on these issues. But he, of course, said um, that the next election would have to be fought on transgender issues. So if you want to have a look at who is fostering toxicity quite deliberately. You don't have to look much further than people like 30p Lee. Anderson, but but why do you think it's toxic? Mike says because the far right want to use it as a wedge issue, like like the boats. There's a big uh, uh, American neo-Nazi money introducing trans people. Uh, pretty strong stuff, Mike. Uh, Dan brings 30p Lee into the mix. People like him using it to incite further anger and confusion as a, a, a an electoral wedge. Um, please don't use my name. I've been I've got to be careful on that. Uh, I think a lot of the toxicity for the debate comes from this, James. Many trans people come from a background of being bullied. And although this may have changed, statistically, they have experienced sexual assault. This means that when the other quotes side end quote suggests that a trans person should be kept out of the toilet, it feels like a personal attack. So rather than logic kicking in, emotion often kicks in. This in itself is an issue because it means that you're saying most trans people are mentally ill. I myself am transitioning and have been sexually assaulted multiple times but if i highlight this to the trans community it immediately explodes another interesting aspect is that the private sector seems to be speeding through treatment therapy took me less than three sessions to get onto hrt but maybe that's because i was so certain i wanted to transition and had wanted to for as long as i can remember i understand what you're saying Um, But, of course, that is a contribution to a conversation about something a bit different from the medical treatment of children. Uh, And Chris says, please, will you remember that there are um, uh, uh, trans boys and trans men as well, that that, that girls transition to male. The first caller, Chris, perhaps you tuned in a little late. And I'm not saying that snarkily, but, but, but the very first caller was talking to us about her transgender son. So we'll continue with this, I think, until about half past, nine minutes after 11. If... I, I, I mean, it's tough, isn't it? And I don't necessarily offer up this observation with huge amounts of, of, of generosity. But if you have listened to the parents and the transgender people talking on air today, and you do see yourself as being on the other side of the argument, I, I, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but 
um, I don't have to. I, I've got texts, I suppose, that could do that. People denying the reality of what they have described, people denying the validity of what they have described. Then Hillary Cass's report certainly hasn't vindicated you. She's gone out of her way to stress that she's doing neither of those things. She's not. She's not in any way questioning the the reality of the process or or, or indeed the the, the, the status. But if you are on the other, quote, side of the football pitch and you think that it should be harder for children to access some elements of the treatment that they have been able to access, then I'd like you to tell me why it is so toxic. Because your position isn't particularly pungent in, in and of itself. You know, I, 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 Rachel, a trans woman, suggested 16. We've already spoken to the parents of children who received medication before that age. You've got to put the line somewhere, particularly for trans men. The physical development that comes with puberty is is quite frightening, quite traumatic as a, as a, as a prospect. But, but why do you think it is so toxic? Uh, 10 minutes after 11 is the time. 03456060973 is the number. Sarah is in Elephant and Castle. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, Hello. Yes, I'm a, I'm a mum of a trans teen. And um, the, the care, the medical care, has been non-existent from the NHS. Um, so we've had to do it all ourselves. You know, initially it was me and Google. Okay? Right. Um, That's suboptimal. And, and, it is, but that's uh, now it's like that for for everyone. Yeah. Anyone who's got somebody who's under sixteen is having to do it themselves. Now, my child has always known. I didn't. Know, she's always known, and then she told me at eleven. So initially, you don't do anything with this kind of information. You kind of just go, okay. And then you kind of start because it had, it's something that I had never thought about. It wasn't even a, in my world. Like uh, you know, I don't know anyone transgender. Oh, I didn't then. Yeah. Until now. Um, anyway, so then at 13, um, she said it again. You know, we're a very liberal family. So I said, look, if you are, you are. If you're not, you're not. It's fine. You know, and then at 13, it was time to start doing something okay. serious about this. And so, you know, at 11, we went to the doctor. The doctor said, there's nothing I can do. I can put you on a waiting list. I said, fine, go for it. Got on the late waiting list and then we shelved that. Life carried on. And then at 13, I went back and we were still sort of three or four years out from, from, um, the NHS care and he couldn't do anything to help me he he, he, he knew nothing about the process that he could advise me on yeah. so I phoned a doctor in Spain um, and I and I, cons- I used them as a consultant and I asked them what's the process like step by step what do you do you know so if you've got a cold and you go to the doctor he does an assessment and he, you either you know the first is okay you need an antibiotic you need erythromycin if you take that and that doesn't work, you go back, they give you something else. You know, there's like a flow chart of events that happen. Yes. And in Spain, with transgender issues, if a family goes in and they've got a child that's transgender, um, that sets off protocols. And the first thing that happens is they get immediately referred uh, to psychologists. Yes. Okay? Psychologists or psychiatrists, depending on the situation. One for the child and one for the family. Okay, so it's unbelievably good. Um, and then it starts from there. Yeah, no, nothing in this world of trans issues is is quick. None of it. And, and nor should it be, right? But it shouldn't be transphobic either. Um, then um, they told me what to do. Yeah, they, they said they advised puberty blockers if, because everyone needs hormones, mm, right? So mm. people are keep talking about puberty blockers and they're terrible. And I looked into it. And the one that I gave my child had been around for 30 years. Right. Yeah? Patented in the 70s, launched in the 80s. Been around for 30 years. Right? And, and so there's plenty of evidence as to what puberty blockers do. Now, the truth well, they, is... That, that, that is... I, I, that's a challenge to some of what Cass has said, I think, isn't it? I mean, it? look, that, that might not be as much as she would like. Okay. But there is, there is evidence, you know. And, and also, the use of puberty blockers, right? It's a temporary thing. Yes. Yeah, you shouldn't use puberty blockers for more than two years. Right. The, the, the effects are reversible, yeah, because all it does is block hormones, but everybody needs hormones, so you shouldn't use them long term. They're not a solution. You have to choose whether you have male hormones or female hormones. And the changes from the hormones, those are permanent, okay? But the changes from the hormones that you get if you go through puberty are also permanent, which is why puberty blockers are so essential when they're young. Yeah. The question is when you take them. So for us, what we did is we we went and tried to preserve fertility. That took me about 50 phone calls, by the way, 
to different companies. Right. Um, and we wanted to preserve fertility. And so we went in, got tested. Sperm wasn't there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so we waited. And then, and then uh, you know, every sort of four or five months, they went back, um, wow. did, did tests. And, and, then, and then the sperm were there. And they were like, fine, freeze it. Let's do it. And so we froze the sperm. So we preserved fertility. And then she, she went on puberty blockers. Okay. And so she was on puberty blockers for a while. This sounds like a full-time job, Sarah, for you. It, it, well, it, it's not really. You know, well, you just got uh, well only because I got this doctor in Spain, right, to tell me to tell me what to do. And then, and, and is then the I doctor? Did, sorry to interrupt you. So you're saying too much interesting stuff. I don't want to let any of it slip away. Is, w- w- was the doctor in Spain an outlier? Is the doctor in Spain like an international figure? No, on, on... no, no, no. They're, 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 they're more open. As, as Catholic right. and Texas, as I've always thought Spain to be. <laughs> they, yes. I'm, I'm Spanish, by the way, before Haiti. No, I, fi- I, I figured you were, but thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Um, um, that they have been remarkable. Yeah. The extended family in Spain, beyond remarkable. I oh, mean, really, really good. Um, but anyway, we digress. The, the, the well, point is that then... Yes. Um, so you get... So then, you, go on. At the, yeah, so we had puberty bloggers, but at the same time, I found um, a clinical psychologist in this country, a fantastic one, fantastic one, right? I, I don't know if I can say the name or not. You know, normally trans people talking about trans things are discreet to name it because of the haters. Sure. Yeah? Um, stay clear then I don't want it to bring any trouble to anybody's doorstep no but this this, this doctor it was phenomenal phenomenal okay. right and so we saw her but really expensive right I was paying £275 a time okay yeah. you know and then so, so she went through that process with the clinical psychologist and the clinical psychologist who's got more than 20 years experience in this area said I, I do believe that, that, that this change is likely to be permanent Okay, so then we waited another six months, and she started female hormones. Right. You know, so the the process takes a long time. Um, uh, uh, If if every transgender child or every child questioning their gender Mm -hmm. had had the support and the experience that you describe, I'm not sure there'd have been anything for Hillary Cass to investigate. No, there would there wouldn't be, you know. And the Tavistock, you know, they may have made mistakes, right? Well, they did make mistakes. I think we know they made mistakes. There's some very well documented cases of people suffering profound regret at the treatment they received. Let me let me give you let me give you a couple of different examples, right? There was that 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 crazy nurse that killed all those babies, yeah, yeah, and that was because of a lack of processes in that hospital. And the reaction wasn't to shut that maternity unit down. You see, the reaction was we must never let this happen again. How do we fix that? Yeah. They didn't shut it down, right? You have okay. um, women, another example that I'm going to give you is, you know, women having abortions, right? Um, of course, there are going to be women that regret it, but you don't turn around and close all the abortion clinics in the Southeast because 1% of women regret it. You don't close them down, which is what they effectively did. They and that, that is what you, that's what you think you're hearing today, is, is that so, you find a, 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 a small minority of people who've undergone something who regret undergoing it, and the response you think you're seeing and hearing is that you, you therefore know, make it much harder or make it impossible until you're much older for people to receive similar treatment. Think, I don't even think it's trans people causing this problem. I, I think it's haters. They've invented this, this. They've invented a problem that doesn't exist, right? Trans women going into women's toilets. I mean, I don't know anybody or know anybody that knows anybody that's ever had a, an issue in a toilet. Right? No, ever. but I, I, I do. Right? I, I do. I, and, okay. I, and, and also, yeah. I'll get 100 more now by 11.25. Yeah, so, oh, I'm, I'm sure you will. And, they won't, sure and, you and, will. and most of them will be telling me the truth. So it does happen. It does exist. And, yeah. and people tell me, someone but I know, a friend of mine told me quite recently about their daughter being in a, in a toilet and, and someone coming in and it made their daughter uncomfortable. It happens. Yeah, but, but, if, but who came in, a trans woman or a man? Well, some do, people do, would do, say, what's the difference, wouldn't they? Because a cis man pretending to be a woman... Yeah, is a threat. Is a predator, but a genuine trans a woman trans is woman. not. But, but, the, but the admission and of trans the trans woman makes the entry yeah. of the cis man much easier, is, I think, the argument. Although it's not but one then, I fully... But then, but then the problem you have as well, right? There's that trans boxer. I can't remember his name. He just got um, knocked out. Tra- trans man, right? Okay. He's a boxer. Yeah. So he was natal woman, right? right? But he's a boxer. So you can imagine... The muscles and the size. Yeah. Right? So he would be able to go into a woman's toilet. That would be more threatening, I think, if 
you know, you wanted to be scared or I something. Tried to, I tried to. You make a point. I mean? I, yeah, I tried to leave the toilets out of it today, Sarah. Well, and, 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 and we've done a pretty good job so far, but I understand I, because now you're talking about the toxicity, which is a question I hadn't actually articulated yet, so I will now. You've begun to answer it. Where, where does the, this level of toxicity come from, including from people who are supportive of transgender children. So I think the toxicity comes from a made-up source. I think it's just political... No, but what about the other side? Because what about the toxicity directed, for example, at J.K. Rowling? Where does that come from? Well, because, see, J.K. Rowling is transphobic, okay? Uh, you see, that's, she, that's, that's a no, toxic she, contribution to the conversation. I, I in, understand, I understand but, it's, but the, look, a racist person doesn't like to be called racist any more than a transphobic person likes to be called transphobic. Now, somebody who denies gender identity... Yeah, the existence of gender identity. Yeah, that is transphobic. That would be like. But I don't think she does. Does she? Doesn't she say she, she recognises the existence of gender identity? But no, she doesn't. Whatever your gender identity no. is, you can never be a biological male or female. No, trans people don't say that you can be a biological woman. No, you probably you follow followed her comments more closely than I have to be I, fair. I mean, but. I try not to, but it does come. You know, you get the algorithms and it so, comes. So. Th- the toxicity, you're almost saying that the yeah. toxicity directed at her is justified, which is unhelpful, isn't it, I mean, in, in I some think, ways? I don't think that there should be toxicity, right? Mm. So, so she shouldn't be getting hate. She should be getting education. Now, I think some trans people try to educate her. They try to explain um, why they were so upset. You know, and, and look, don't get me wrong, right? When, when I first got into this world because of my daughter, I was one of the people that used to say... But why is J.K. Rowling transphobic? She's just protecting women's right, women's right. rights. I don't, okay. I don't understand. That was my statement. I actually said that out loud to my daughter. And she said, but what are you protecting them from? And that's where, that's where I began to educate myself. And then I changed my mind because I realized I was wrong. Because what I was protecting them from was from something made up. You know, we, if, if, if so the threat. So, so it's not made up, is it? It's just mis. And we're going to run out of time, but I need to get this right because the the invasion of women only spaces by cis men pretending to be trans yeah, women. That's a different thing. Yes, but it's real. But uh, that, it might that, be overrepresented. But you have to protect but it, women from that. But 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 again, we're back to punishing innocent people for the putative crimes of guilty people, aren't we? We're punishing all trans women for the actions of non-trans women. Yeah. And that and, seems and, and quite an unfair thing to do. Just very briefly, Christine says this is such a difficult situation. We'd all agree with that. I don't yeah. think J.K. Rowling is transphobic. I think she's a feminist. Just address that for me if you can quickly. I'm a, I, I'm a feminist. Of course I'm a feminist. I'm a, I'm feminist. a woman and I'm, a li- I'm glad to hear it. I'm Spartacus. I'm a woman, <laughs> I'm a woman <laughs> and I'm a feminist. Of course I am. But I don't, and I, I, you know, I want women, I want people, the world, to protect women. Protect women from those idiots that catcall down the road protect women from domestic abuse situations protect women from real danger saying that you're protecting women from trans women i think is ridiculous ridiculous I've, I, you know oh, most wow. trans women are so vulnerable they're so vulnerable because this is such a tough and that, road. That, that becomes clear every time we open the phone lines on this issue i i, I know i said i'd finish but how how, how is your daughter getting on I mean, she's great. Good. She's great. You know, we had a little transphobic bump in school um, with the leadership, not with the students or most of the teachers. Right. That was a little bit rubbish, but it's okay. It's okay. And you she's know, got and, you. And I always speak to mums like you, and I start immediately worrying for the for the children who don't have mums like you. It's a, it, 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 it's it's um, I, 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 exemplary the concern and the care that you've shown uh, and described. Thank you. It's twenty three minutes after eleven. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 11. I, 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 mean, I don't know whether she r- invites or, or, or relishes it, but it does often come back to J.K. Rowling because she has become such a powerful and, and prominent maypole for uh, one side of this debate, although I'm still not 100% confident describing w- what side she is on. I balk at the use of the phrase transphobic because it seems to me to be a hefty accusation but many of you are pretty clear that the cap fits this this from emma from my point of view genuinely personal she is transphobic when someone denies my identity they're calling me not just mentally incompetent they're calling me subhuman any response to that insult is now being labeled as toxic and they stress once again from my point of view 
Um, and they add, my sapphic-oriented timeline is full of butch lesbians being punched for their assumed gender. How is it feminist to stoke that violence? Um, which means, I think, and they'll correct me pretty quickly if I'm wrong, that a lesbian who looks butch is being accused regularly on a, a, a lesbian-heavy timeline of not actually being a woman at all. And the question then is, how is it feminist to stoke that violence? Uh, 26 after 11 is the time. What will probably be the last word on this is going to come from Frida, who is in Manchester. Frida, what would you like to say? Um, Aya, thanks for taking my call. You're very welcome. Um, well, I've, I've been in the mire of this debate for quite some time, and I've been on a guest on various TV shows. and ra I was on Nick Ferrari's show and not long ago, and what I've noticed is there are certain people being censored in this debate. Now, I don't want to mention too many names, but it, it keeps being like a distraction technique. So we keep talking about J.K. Rowling, yes. and we keep talking about these people. And what it does is it stops people talking about the real issue. So when something like this happens, when the cast review comes out, mm. it's all focused through a lens of uh, transphobia. I will use that word. Now, personally... Well, it I hasn't been be today. J.K. Rowling popped up once or twice for reasons, but the conversation we've been having since 10 o'clock this morning has been uh, incredibly illuminating. And oh, no, no, nobody's, been nobody's been well, silenced. Nobody's been silenced. This is what I'm saying. This is the first time I've heard so many parents of trans people, trans oh, okay. people speak, because it's very rare. Because mm. I, I, the only reason I've got into the media is by ringing up producers and saying, "You got this wrong here. Can you please?" And, and that's I'm not a media. I'm not a journalist. I'm, I write a blog. That's what I do, okay. and I just collect, I collect information. So, so it's, so it's so frustrating to hear the word trans constantly and hear your life being talked about. I mean, I, I, I work as a volunteer with the LGBT Foundation in Manchester, and right. I just see a lot of traumatized young people. Yes. Let me ask you then, what, what, where do you think what Hilary Cass describes as toxicity comes from? I think it's a, I think it's a very divisive issue. And I rest, I'm very rest, reticent to say both sides, but yeah. there are a both sides. Yes. But I, we, I, don't, I think it's created by um, a very right-wing media, to put it mildly, the Daily Mail, the Telegraph. Uh, they, they seem to be captured by lobbyists, and, and I, I'll, I'm sure you've heard of the Policy Exchange, I'm sure you've heard of um, the IEA, and they release, documents to, they release documents to the government. Well, I know the Policy Trans Exchange has, I didn't know IEA had. So, so there, there is, but that is, uh, you know, these secretly funded uh, so-called mm. think tanks that, that yeah. gravitate around Tufton Street are always trying to p p manipulate the p political discourse yeah. in favour of whoever it is that secretly funds them and, and distraction from, for example, wealth inequality and, and, and wealth distribution yeah. has been in their, been in their um, uh, arsenal since Andrew Neil first invited one of their godfathers to write for the Sunday Times 150 years ago. So I, 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 I kind of get that side of it. I, so I, I, briefly, if you would, what, what 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 are you feeling today, having had the chance to hear or look at some of what Hillary Cass has concluded? Well, I'm just in the process of writing some bullet points about okay. it, and I think I think what a lot of people are misconstruing this as a as sort of an expose of some kind of abuses that have been going on against children. At yes, a, it's at not a, that, is it? It's, you can't no, really it, read it, the it, words it, she's it, written and arrive at that what, conclusion. <laughs> what The conclusion I've come to is quite a dense document, so yes, it is. I wouldn't claim to have read it all, but what, I, what comes out of it is the NHS is failing, and this is the tip of a very big mental health iceberg. Yes. And unfortunately, trans people, trans children, get processed through a mental health pathway. So I have a friend, well, I had a friend who took her own life while she was waiting on a pathway. Now, I, there's a lot of complex reasons why somebody might take their own life. I accept that. It's yes. not just one doctor's decision. It's not just one service. But the fact that she was on a mental health pathway when she could have just been supported by a local group or a, a counsellor, well, it would still, I see what you mean. So it would still be a mental health pathway, but it would be somehow bespoke and tailored towards yeah. transgender yeah. or gender what, confusion what, rather than being lumped in with all other yeah. mm. mental what health I'm, treatments. 
Go on. What I'm, tell- what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but what I'm saying is <laughs> the NHS is failing and this is a tip of a very big iceberg. Well, everyone agrees I, on I, that. It's, it's, it's a bizarre one, isn't it? So the, the, I'm, I'm just cracking on only because I, I want to squeeze in one more call. Um, if I can, before the news. So I'll be a little bit late for the news. But I want to hear from Scott, who's in Lanark. What, what what made you pick up the phone, Scott? <laughs> I was just what you were saying at the start of the, the kind of intro there, James. Thanks for taking my call, first mm. of all. Uh, it's just, I think my, my opinions on the, the whole the whole subject, the whole issue have changed uh, quite considerably over a, a number of years. Uh, and I think the biggest issue that most people face is we have no frame of reference for it. When you look at any other polarising issue, you can see both sides of it. You look at the, the situation in the Middle East, you, you understand the history, the context, why people feel what they feel. With this, as a, I believe the terms a cis male, you know, yeah. you know, I just don't have any concept of not being who comfortable you are. with who I am. Yeah. And I think this, the... And I think that can lay doubt in people's minds. So without having the frame of reference to understand where people are coming does, from... Does it make us feel threatened when we don't understand? Oh. Somebody says, I am a transgender man, I am a transgender woman, mm. and we feel threatened in, in, in somehow in ourselves by that? Uh, because what's, believe, what made you negative towards it, do you think? Uh, it can't be just uh, confusion, because confusion is uh, not a negative force. Yeah, uh, to, to be, you know, I was never, I was never anti, but okay. I, I, you know, I, I, I certainly, I, I was very sceptical, I was doubtful, and when you don't understand things, you you try to rationalise it in potentially negative ways. Uh, and the, the big thing for me is I, I, I challenged why I felt the way I felt, uh, and and it and it boiled down to a lack of understanding. Uh, and as, as long as the issue is so as polarised as it is, I, you know, I don't think we're going to get anywhere without sitting down rationally and trying to take some emotion out of it. And, and, uh, and, and that probably involves, probably involves a, 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 an acceptance of the reality of the existences that we've heard described on the programme today. And, and there are still plenty of people uncomfortable with that. And that's where perhaps the parallels with homosexuality and homophobia do apply. Uh, the, 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 the calls I took on this programme until relatively recently, and I'm sure I'd take them again if we opened up the phone lines, uh, denying the existence of homosexuality, claiming that it's not a thing, it's impossible, you know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, all, all of those things, people would not acknowledge the reality of, thought it was fake or, or, or some weird attention-seeking choice. That, that, that reminds us, as people, of course you up to insist that transgender people are are, are, are are mentally ill or mistaken or wrong there are parallels there and I think Scott's probably right that resolution or improvement in the situation for, for everybody but particularly for these children probably involves paying a little bit less attention to them I don't know that's, 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 I sound like Jerry Springer now doing final thoughts but yeah there must be a way to protect everyone everyone's rights whether whether female or transgender says caroline and and i think there probably is it's just a question of appetite thomas watts is here now with your headlines james o'brien on lbc and breathe it's eleven you're listening to james o'brien on lbc we continue a conversation now about uh, younger people but I, I think i think i can say with some confidence a, a potentially less controversial conversation than, than previous ones. Although I would just take a moment to say thank you to everybody who's uh, been in touch to compliment us here because you, you have to remember that Roxy and, and Eleanor answer the phones as well and it can be quite a fraught issue, this one. Um, so we do appreciate your comments about how well handled that entire conversation was and how compelling the, the, the callers were. I'll, I'll read one just because to read more would be self-indulgent. And listening to the callers like your last one, James, is the reason that I tune into your show. She provided such clarity to the debate. What an amazingly clear and concise summary of the situation at present with NHS treatment and waiting times too. And then for balance, Jean's been in touch in capital letters to say these are children with a mental illness. And the danger, I guess, is to see those two as representative of the two sides that uh, that Hillary Cass describes. Um, and uh, that's probably doing a disservice to, to other people on the same side of this argument as Gene. But you might want to wonder why you're on the same side of the argument as, as Gene. I don't know. 11.38 is the time. Can you name the technology secretary? Go on. Can you? 
Yeah, Michelle Donnellan. She's looking at imposing a restriction that is designed to protect young people from the harmful effects of social media. Right, pay attention, will you? Because I, I, I get a bit sort of emotionally battered by, by conversations like the ones we've just had. So I, I don't want to lose some of the fascinating elements of this conversation. I don't want to sort of be a bit lazy. So this is really important, and it's really, really interesting. Not least because I can feel my oil tanker turning on this. I've been impressed by few people more in the last year than, than, than um, Esther Jai, the, the mother of Brianna Jai, the teenager murdered by two 15-year-olds who'd been watching violent content online. I haven't met Esther yet, uh, and, and obviously a crucial part of her campaign is derived from the fact that her daughter's murderers had watched violent content online but i think if if i'm reading it and remembering correctly i think also some of brianna's experiences online her negative experiences online uh, contribute to esther's mission contribute to her campaign for under 16s to be banned from accessing social media entirely and i was pretty clear and it was it was a tough one i don't think we went in perhaps quite as hard as we would have done if the territory if the background to the story hadn't been so emotionally um traumatic that's such a horrible story uh, the, the, the 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 story of brianna but i was pretty skeptical about the likelihood of esther's campaign succeeding in fact i would say i was about as close to 100 percent skeptical that it's possible to be without quite being 100 percent. so that would be 99.9 percent .9 recurring wouldn't it because it seemed to me to be the classic case the classic case and i've got a weird i've got a weird affection for the moments the tiny tiny the tiny moments the precious few the vanishingly few moments when a metaphor is completely perfect. And this is a case of trying to get the genie back in the bottle. And for anybody unfamiliar with that metaphor, or indeed the mythology of genies, it's a metaphor for impossible. You can't get... It's almost impossible. You can't get the genie back... In, unless you waste one of your three wishes on getting the genie back in the bottle. And why would you do that anyway? But the, the, you, you, you hear the figure of a speech, you hear the metaphor quite a lot, and there it is. Uh, the, you cannot get the genie back in the bottle and that is what i believed and i think i still do but my goodness me it's nowhere near 99.99999 percent recurring anymore in fact it's probably moving at breakneck speed towards the infernal ratio and you know what the infernal ratio is altogether now 5248 I'm probably close to 52% confidence this could never happen. And let's not forget that this is not a perfect... This is a, a Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good situation. It, it, this is a, a, a pretty clear uh, example of an issue where you are never going to have a 100% success rate. But you don't... Guess what? Come here. You don't have a 100% success rate on anything in this field. You know that it's illegal for people under 18 to, to, to buy alcohol? Guess what? Some of them do. I think it's illegal for them to drink. It's not illegal for them to drink alcohol, actually. That's one of those really weird legal anomalies. Same with babysitting. Same with leaving children on their own. There's no... I digress. Uh, it's, it's illegal for children to smoke. But guess what? They still do. It's illegal for children to buy cigarettes. But guess what? They still do. So you're never going to have... It's illegal to... What else is it illegal to do? Travel in a car without a safety belt. But guess what? They still do. It's illegal to, to smoke in pubs. But guess what? Some people still do it. So you never have. I don't know why we sometimes come at these issues as if 100% success is achievable or plausible or... Uh, uh, or, 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 crucially, a gauge of whether the legislation has worked or not. Um, so bear that in mind when I tell you that the government, or at least the current technology secretary, is looking at banning children under 16 from buying mobile phones. And there are two responses to this for me. The first is, oh, what an interesting development in a fascinating conversation about getting a genie back into that. And the second is, am I missing something here or has she completely taken leave of her senses? Because how many, put your hand up now, if you bought your own mobile phone when you were under 16. Go on, put your hand up. You, you, you walked into Car Phone Warehouse or other providers are available. You walked with a pocket full of paper round money 
You can tell I was born in the 70s, can't you? You walked into, into Carphone Warehouse with a pocket full of paper around money, you slapped it on the and you said, give me a phone, give me your finest phone and make it snappy. That would be in the days of the flip phones. Uh, the, the, who did that? Which, so who, what, hello? Hands up? No? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No one has put their hands up. Admittedly, I can only see two people. Uh, and one of them isn't really concentrating. So what's she talking about is question number one. What is she actually talking? A genuine question. What is she actually talking about? 0345 6060 973. Would this make the blindest bit of difference to anything at all? Well, yes, it would. It would, it, would, it would deal with the vanishingly small number of children under 16 who bought their own phone in person with their own money. Second question, then. What would work? What percentage of children do you think have a phone by the age of 12? And remember, these days, it would almost certainly be a smartphone. Have a guess. Go on. What percentage of children have a phone by the age of 12? 12 years old. Got a smartphone. Go on. Nope. Higher. Guess again. Higher. 97. 97% have a phone by the age of... This is an Ofcom poll last year. And by the time you get to 17, it's 99%. So outlawing phone sales, I read today, to under 16s is one option being considered under a consultation on protecting children online. And I would say that even without having seen what the other options are, it's almost certainly the stupidest. Any new law would only ban the sales of mobile phones directly to children and would not stop parents from buying their children phones. I, I, I just, I, as I say, occasionally I read something and I think it must be me that's missing something because surely you could not have risen to the dizzy heights of government, of, of Secretary of State, no less, for technology and somehow arrived at the conclusion that this is a good idea. So perhaps I am missing something. Which leads us to the two questions that perhaps you might be able to answer. And the first is, do you think we can get the genie back in the bottle? Do, 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 because what Esther Jai is campaigning for is actually the banning of under-16s from accessing social media. So the first people that can contribute to this programme are people who understand the world of tech pretty well. People who ideally have worked for, perhaps, Facebook or WhatsApp or TikTok, less likely in, in, in the final case, because I think it's owned by the Chinese government. But they, they must have an office here. They must have employees here. So you've worked for these companies. How feasible is it? Is it something that actually we think would be really, really difficult but bearing in mind that we're not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, so there is no earthly way that um, uh, you're going to have a 100% success rate. You introduce a law, you introduce a, a policy, and if any 15-year-old anywhere is found with a access to social media, the policy has failed. That's a stupid way of approaching this. Uh, just looking to improve the current scenario. So is it feasible... Is it possible to get the genie back in the bottle? 03456060973. How would you do it? What might work? So I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that the latest idea from the technology secretary is absolutely hat stand. Banning children from doing something they don't currently do. Unless I'm wrong, and, and I don't think I am. No one, I'm just glancing at my inbox. Nobody has telling me that, no, actually, I bought my own phone when I was 12 years old. I had nothing to do with my parents. They were cut out. They, in fact, they didn't even want... I just don't think it happens. So what would work? If you want to get... There's two things going on here. One's about phones and one's about social media. You marry the two together and the answer perhaps becomes only letting under-16s use phones that aren't smart, only phones that don't access social media. But what, what would happen? Actually, that's too difficult a question to ask. Let's start with the two simple ones. Number one is, can we get the... Do you think it's even possible to turn this oil tanker around? To, to think about the smoking ban. I, I, if I'd asked you 20 years ago, or whenever it was, 25 years ago, do you think we could ever actually ban smoking? And you'd go, oh, don't be ridiculous, James. We couldn't ban smoking in, in public places. There's no way we could. So is it so genuine? And it's, a, it's an entirely opinion-based question, this one. 
And, and I don't normally do entirely opinion-based questions because I'm so much more interested in experiences. They're much more helpful to, to changing minds and developing opinions. But this is, this is a big one. This is a really big one. Is it, do, you think it's, do you think it's even possible to stop children having phones and then from a position of experience, understanding and knowledge, <clears throat> how hard would it be to stop children accessing social media? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Fill your boots on this one. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. It's 1148. James O'Brien on LBC. 1151 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And uh, is this a genie that we can actually get back in the bottle? Talking about smartphones and under 16s accessing, specifically under 16s accessing. Social media. Um, Philly Boots, John's in Croydon. John, what do you want to say? Morning, James. Hello, John. James, when I was about 17 or so, I tried to sign up to some betting apps. And there were some lads in the sixth form who were gambling, and we, I thought they wanted to join in. Hmm. To try and do that, you needed to link your phone with your bank account. You yeah. needed to have um, a picture next to some sort of photo ID, like a passport or something, not like... Um, your library card or something yeah. like that. Something <laughs> doing. Yes, um, yes. And... And it was incredibly hard to the point that I couldn't do it. And then if you had to then re-log in to use some sort of similar verification system that is already employed by betting companies, so it's not like we're just coming up with it out of nowhere, um, and just apply it to Facebook. I mean, they've got, when, when they want to, they're incredibly clever. And I don't know if you know, but on the government website, recently had to do a uh, DV, uh, DVS check. If you remove the case of your phone and hold it up to your passport, it will scan it and take the picture and every other bit of information necessary straight to your iPhone. So with this sort of technology that the government and people already have in place, I mean, if you can't... You'd think it would be easy. I mean, to be honest, we're coming at this from similar angles. You you are a former 17-year-old who struggled to get onto a gambling website, so neither of us are what you might call tech broskies or or Silicon Valley experts, but I'm persuaded by what you're reminding me of, and I'm pretty sure there are other areas. It's incredibly easy to access pornography online. I wouldn't know, James. No, nor nor would I. I'm just, this is what I've read. And, Uh. And I'm pretty sure it used to be it used to be more difficult i could be wrong but you put you can put an age limit on a gambling website therefore you can put an age limit on a pornography website and therefore you can put an age limit on a social media web to prove your age online is probably not as difficult as some people like us to think i also think so when i was 13 tried to sign up to um social media that was about when it was first coming out and um I think you couldn't be on there till you say like 15 or 16. So you fail at 19, mine birthday's 98. So if I yeah. put in 98, oh, fail. So you, you just change it. Like seven, six, yeah. five, oh, brilliant. Yeah. I'm now allowed on. And that, it's got to be something a bit better than that, I'd say. Yeah, me too. I like your contribution as well for two reasons. It's quite straightforward and it's just thinking based on experience. But I'm interested in thinking that's not even based on experience. This genie can be, I think this genie can be got back in the bottle. I think, I don't owe Esther Jai an apology because I certainly wasn't rude about her, but I am feeling my oil tanker, (laughs) I'm feeling my oil tanker turn. Uh, Which sit there, sometimes you think because something exists and it's become so embedded and it's so commonplace, you think, no, we can't possibly do things differently. That's why I reach for the smoking ban or or the compulsory safety belts in cars, things that you never would have thought. Can you think of other examples? You can text them to me, actually, 84850, or indeed uh, you can WhatsApp them these days. If if that is, is that helpful to talk about WhatsApp at this point in this conversation? Is that is that social media WhatsApp? It is, isn't it? So you shouldn't. No, oh, three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is the number that you need. I, I just meant, you know, here we are, delighted to be able to accept WhatsApps to the program while talking about the dangers and the horrors of social media. But we're all we're all grown ups here, allegedly. So I, 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 what else would you put on that list? You, what, what else would you put on the list of things that seemed impossible when they were first suggested, but actually happened? And now it's all fairly straightforward. Thank you very much. Paul's in Stratford-upon-Avon. I'm, I'm due there soon, Paul. I've got a, I've got a b- book gig coming up, but I digress. What made you pick up the phone? Yeah, we'll pop into our shop anytime. Well. <laughs> so we're we're in uh, yeah we're in the centre of Stratford. So yeah, I mean my background's um, web development. 
And um, we've had quite a lot of experience with social platforms. And I think that the topic of underage, anyone under 16, getting access to these social features has always been a bit of a concern for us, right. especially through TikTok. Um, I mean, I, I should probably um, highlight some of the things that the previous caller was saying, which is exactly what, what we think. The quick fix is really um, a, an, ident- uh, an ID process before sign up um my my how long my would it take you to is, code that well facebook could implement that yeah but, you know they probably already had that that type of system within within their ecosystem and what would anyway. i need to prove that because some people would get through it but the the, the 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 efficacy of the idea would be judged by how many people didn't how how, how what would i need for example to to get in well, what's the first thing that you get, identification you get at 16 is probably a national bank account. National insurance number. Yeah, exactly. National insurance number, bank account, um, first bank account. It would be, pr- I think that the reason why these social platforms don't want to actually um, enforce something like that is because it's all about active user base through their platform. Yeah. The more active users they've got, the more advertising space that they can essentially sell to to certain people. But um, I think the absolutely most horrific thing was when I was investigating TikTok in terms of uh, whether or not it's going to be suitable for our business marketing. And as a um, male signing up to TikTok on multiple accounts, I was actually horrified how many, how much of the content delivered to me was essentially kids in school uniform, young girls, and you read the comments in there and there's just grotesque stuff from guys saying, hey, you look pretty, this, that, and the other. So there's a massive, um, uh, you know... So they'd take a hit commercially if if they got rid of a lot of what are essentially their, their, their customers or their users. Yeah, I mean, TikTok, you know, way back you when, think, as a, as a, a dancing app. Yeah, no, as a, as, a, as a web developer, you think it could be done really, really easily? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I do too now. To. I do too now. I mean, let's hear arguments from people in the sector who don't want to do it really easily. Or, I mean, maybe there is a more complicated reason as to why it shouldn't happen. You know, Facebook group for your gymnastics club or, or, or your, your, your stamp collecting club or something, and children being excluded from that would be... I, I, even I can't pretend that this is a powerful argument, but that that that, that is another reason to give Brianna Jai... To give Esther Jai, forgive me, to give Esther credit is is that, you know, she comes out and she says, I want to ban all under 16s from social media, from accessing social media. And we all go, oh, don't be ridiculous. You might as well try and get the toothpaste back in the tube. And actually, if you stop and think about it, and as we've demonstrated with the first two callers, speak to people, uh, certainly in Paul's case, uh, who, who know what they're talking about from inside the industry or with the previous caller who've experienced as we all have from outside the industry the the the, the real difficulty of logging on to site opening a, ba- a, a gambling account how hard is it to open a gambling account why is it much easier to get onto social media when the dangers posed by social media to children are probably greater in total than the dangers posed by gambling it's a question you might want to have a crack at answering. 0345 60973 is the number you need. And it, it doesn't matter if there are flaws in the suggestions. All that matters is whether or not it would massively, exponentially improve the current situation. James O'Brien on LBC. You're not really producing the good so far on um, uh, coming up with things that, we, that, that seemed impossible because the challenges seemed so great. And then actually, when somebody found the political will to do it, it, it became quite well it, it happened it actually happened um and all we've got so far are the ones i came up with which were safety belts becoming compulsory in cars and i suppose you could add car seats to that list and and the smoking ban karen has sent me the words streakers at rugby does anyone want to have a crack at if you pardon the pun does anyone want to have a go at working out what karen is talking about there is it did they ban i Streakers are. At the street. I mean, has she texted the wrong radio program? Is this meant for somebody else, or is she listening on catch up to something that happened in the small hours of the morning? Why would Why would Karen text me streakers at rugby? I do. I, I do not know. But I I'm beginning to think the more we talk about it. Actually, sometimes I say to you, the more I think about it, like I spend my life with my uh, 
you know, what, what is it you do? You put your, you're a bit like Michael Barrymore back in the day. You put your fist on your forehead and you go, is it the thinker? It's the thinker, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's, it's not Bruce Forsyth. It's, it's Rodan or someone like that. You, you put, you, I spend my life like that, thinking about things, thinking about different... Go away, children. Daddy's thinking. God, actually, come to think of it, I wish I could introduce that into the family vocabulary. But I, I, it's not one I've been thinking about a lot. The more we, we talk about it, the more feasible I think it is that this is an oil tanker that could actually be turned round. Um, I think Karen is definitely listening to a different show, although she's texting me because she's now sent a message, and I presume it's the same Karen. I've got no way of checking, saying women play a bit of snooker at the British Legion. So we started off with streakers at the rugby, and now we've got women playing a bit of snooker at the British Legion. I love messages that aren't meant for me normally. Sometimes I get things saying like, can you pick up a tin of beans? I've got a doctor's appointment at quarter past 12. And because our number is 84850, I think, how can they have got that wrong? But if you've got me saved in your phone, if you've got LBC saved in your phone and you're trying to send a message to Les, for example, and you're just a bit clumsy like me, you accidentally go to LBC, you type, da, 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 da. can you pick up a tin of beans from Morrison's? I've got a doctor's appointment at 12.15. Go to the contacts, L, L, that, and you send it to LBC instead of sending it to Les. So I get messages um, which, are, which are pretty remarkable. Um, I think Vicky and Kathy are listening to the right programme, unlike Karen, uh, when she says the resolution of apartheid is an example. And yeah, it didn't exactly happen overnight and in a very straightforward fashion. But I take your point. And Vicky talks about banning plastic bags. Well, they haven't been banned, Vicky. You can, but you have to pay for banning free plastic bags. Was there uproar about that? Would, would, would the usual suspects have either pretended or genuinely believed that that was an appalling affront upon their freedoms? Probably something in Magna Carta about plastic bags, was there, lads? But yeah, that probably is quite a good example. Banning free um, plastic bags from shops. Most, most shops. And congratulations to Oscar, who's been in touch to say, James, please could you get me a tin of beans on your way home from the studio? Six minutes after 12 is the time. So what do you reckon? And I also want to hear from parents and others who think that it's an absolutely appalling idea to ban under-16s, either from owning smartphones or from accessing social media, because this is genuinely uh, in danger of... The pendulum's in danger of swinging so far in the opposite direction that it flies off, like that time when Liz Truss... Was it Liz Truss who tried to ring a bell? Or was it Jeremy Hunt? Anyway, one of them tried to ring a bell and the, and the clacker. Is that what it's called, Keith? Is it a clacker inside a bell? What's it called? The bonga. The bonga? No, that's um, that's Silvio Berlusconi, isn't it? What is it, what, what is it called? The, the bonga? The bonga? The bonga? The clacker? I better stop now because I'm going to accidentally say a swear word in a minute and none of us would enjoy that. Jack's in Hackney. Jack, where were we? Oh, hey, James. How you doing? Very well, Jack. What do we think about these these issues? I think, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked in educational uh, settings and I've worked with kids for better part of the last decade and I completely agree that phones need to that like, social media for certain definitely needs to be out of the hands of um young people. I think that this policy that this lady has uh, proposed would only work in coordination with other like efforts. For example, the Department of Education would need to put very strong and clear like instructions that phones are to be collected at the start of school and returned at the end of school. Like parents would need to be advised, you know, from primary school, even before then to say, look, we know we love the iPad. We know we love the phone, but this isn't good for your kids. And we now can see the damage is quite clear. What is the damage? Talk me through the damage. You're a teacher, are you, Jack? Yeah. Talk me through the damage. Right, um, everything, like any form of bullying, unfortunately, can be made worse by social media. Oh, yeah. You've got kids who will unfortunately be victims of strangers you know certain schools might have to teach kids about things like airdrops because yeah. people might airdrop unsuitable uh, things to children um even things like unfortunately even things like upskirting pictures or videos yeah, but that's not social media oh but, but that's sharing it on social media is the that's it, sorry that's it, that's, yeah, being a yeah, bit slow yeah. there forgive me jack yeah, because the problem is, is then it becomes a sense that if you're a bullied kid, your tormentor then doesn't stop at 3.15 when school ends. It, it, it goes on 24-7 and they're, they're 
finding things about you and posting them online, et cetera, et cetera. I, I can't see any benefit. And unfortunately for those who want to, I guess, come from the other side of the argument, from an educational standpoint, there is such a marked difference between the kids who are always on their phones and social media and the kids whose parents may have seen one thing happen in school and say, no, give me the phone. Or, or at least exercise, exercise more discretion and control over what is happening on yeah. the phone and how often it is happening. Yeah, that's it, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, do you know what I've realised while you were talking? Mm. I can't quite imagine what the other side would sound like here. A bit like during the smoking debate, when the only person mm. I can remember who was speaking out against banning smoking in pubs was Nigel Flipping Farage. I, I can't imagine a normal person, an ordinary normal person listening to... And, and this is an invitation to them to ring in, by the way. An ordinary normal person who understands uh, the importance of looking after others sitting here thinking, oh, what a load of old rubbish. Jack and James are talking absolute gibberish. My kids need their smartphone. I need my... Well, well, my life would have been awful if I didn't have a smartphone when I was 14. Do you see what I mean? I can't quite see... Yeah. Apart from the money that's made by the social media companies and the influence they accrue, who is going to be sitting there thinking this is a terrible idea? It's different from thinking this is really hard to do, which is a trap I fell into, but who's going to actually think this is a terrible idea? I, um, I, in my... In my experience and in my personal opinion, I think it might be a case that some people immediately say like, well, I want my kids to be able to contact me on the way to and from school, to which I've always responded, buy them an old school phone, no apps, you know, like a Nokia old school phone that you can have the communications with. Certain people don't like to be told what to do. And at the end of the yes. day, unfortunately, particularly when it comes to kids in schools, I think maybe some people don't trust the schools or maybe they want the ability to contact their kids in the middle of the day, which, again, from a day-to-day -day running purpose, I you cannot stress to you enough how bad it is when people are getting phone calls in the middle of the day, then next thing you know, you've got class, you're teaching, everything's fine, then you've got an emergency going on, you have no idea what's going on. Somebody's then said it halfway into you trying to intervene, oh, they got a message about this or somebody sent this or that and everything. There's so no plus. Do you know, you'll find this very hard to believe, Jack, but back in the day, I used to be quite a, 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 an aggressive and occasionally even obnoxious radio presenter. <laughs> and when we used to turn our attention to this question of kids having phones, before I had children of a relevant age, because I've been here for 20 years now, would you believe? I, I used to be incredibly dismissive. I was adamant that my children wouldn't have a phone until they were 37. And any pa any parent any parent who gave their child a phone was, you know, akin to giving them 20 silk cut and a six pack of Stella on a Friday night, even when they were nine. And I do, however, remember people citing that security issue with a phone. And yeah. I would, I'd would always point out, and, and they, to be serious for a moment, they would mention abduction, which, is, of course, is something all parents live in mortal terror of, regardless of how unlikely it is to happen. And I, I did always point out that if, if, if your child was being abducted, it's unlikely that they would have the opportunity to uh, uh, phone you and, and tell you that it was happening. This is back in the day before smartphones. And now, of course, given the tracking capabilities on phones, uh, you, it's unlikely that the, that the criminal would... Um, allow the child to keep the phone or not make sure that there was no phone on the child. So I'm not even sure. It's nice to know where they are, but that's actually just reassurance for the parent. It doesn't really guard against any particular security issues at all, I don't think. I don't well, think. Um, I'm, a, I'm young enough or old enough, I guess, <laughs> to uh, remember when I was in secondary school, I had, you know, a brick-type phone or whatever. But for me, it was little things. Like, my mum would just call me or she would just say text me at you know four o'clock just so i know you're all right there are yes, other ways yes, of course. to check in with your kids other than a geolocating app or something because again then the argument becomes cool what happens when your kids on their phone all day at school and they don't have battery and the phone doesn't work yeah anymore? Yeah, and then the panic kicks in, which wouldn't have kicked out. Goodness knows how my parents coped in the 1980s. Well, I was at boarding school a lot of the time, so it's not really relevant. But before I went away to boarding school, you wouldn't cut, you wouldn't hear from you all day. Go off on your bicycle at 9 o'clock in the morning with your sandwiches in your knapsack. And, uh, and, and back you'd come hours later with the parents having absolutely no way of checking up on you. Um, thank you, Jack. I, I, that was really helpful. And, and uh, that's a genuine invitation to people who, who can remind us what we're missing. 
Because otherwise, they should just ban him for under 16-year-olds now. Get them off, get them off, get them off, get them off social media. Um, which reminds me of Kara's text about streakers on the rugby pitch. It's coming up to quarter past 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you want to join this conversation, you can. I should tell you, coming up a little later in the programme, the new leader, uh, First Minister of Wales, the new Welsh First Minister, Vaughan Gething, will be joining me in the studio. Uh, the plan at the moment is only here for 14 minutes. It's not for him to take calls. But if there's anything particularly particular that you'd like me to ask him, then... Um, do get in touch in all the usual ways. And also, please, if you would, stop sending me hilarious messages about the importance of picking up some beans for you on the way home, or, uh, in Luke's case, trying to emulate Karen's unintentional comedy by sending me messages uh, of, of questionable provenance. OK, it's 12.15. James O'Brien on LBC. Max has been in touch. She says, uh, surely, James, if you'd been on LBC for 20 years, you would have had some sort of special anniversary day on air. I, I, you know, I'd never thought of that, Max. That's a fair, what an excellent pie. No, come off it. Is that, maybe I'll do it for my 21st. Uh, Colin's in Wandsworth. Colin, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Um, Hello, right, until my son was 13, um, I had Google had um, a parental control program on his phone, and I had full control over his phone, so he couldn't install any apps. I didn't want, couldn't visit any websites. I didn't want, and anything he tried, I got a notification asking me to approve it. Okay. The day he was 13, he got an email from Google saying, you can now take over your account. Your parent will no longer have access. Shut the front door. They should change that to 16. Are you serious? Yeah. Uh, even now, I mean, I can still lock his phone down, but obviously I've been in IT for 30 years. I've got a lot of experience. So you know um, what you're doing. Yeah, but for an average person, that, and I'm sure Apple do the same thing with parental controls. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. I had full control over everything he did, what times he could use it, how many hours a day he could use it, everything. Well, I, well isn't that interesting? I didn't. I mean, I, I, I have to take your word for it on the on the Google thing. Is that are you nodding in in agreement with what Colin's describing, or in agreement with me having to take his word? No. So it does. That's on your thirteenth birthday. You get. So what was he logged on to? What was he? Uh, you basically set up a child account when you set their phone up. So you have to set it up as a parent, and then you've got control over it. And they have arbitrarily decided that 13 is the cut-off point, have they? Or is it legal? Yes. Or, or, or? Yeah, I contacted them and they said, yeah, 13 is their cut-off Well, day. working in the sector then, how hard would it be to stop the massive majority of 16-year-olds getting onto social media full stop? Easy. There's only two real phone companies, Apple and Google. They make 99% the of the phones in the world, yeah, the software, so they control... The operating it, systems, access. to use the correct terminology, please, Colin. Yeah, right, Thank I you. not want to overcomplicate it. No, well, it's yeah. all right, mate. I'm not as <laughs> daft as I sound. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they, they, they control everything you can do on a phone. So, really, Apple and Google could control everything. everything so, that so you, be get, you get Apple and Google into, the, into Downing Street, you sit them down and you tell them, you do this, otherwise, for every day it's not done, we'll fine you £5 million. Pounds. Yeah, just, I mean, I'd only stop it on phones, obviously, not computers, but, um, why? yeah. Why? Just remind me why? Uh, because on a computer, well, then you've got to set up different access controls on a computer for your children as well, which you could do, also do as well. But, um, but there's something about the phone that's particularly invidious, isn't there, having it in your pocket. What were you worried about, or was it just a general concern? Did you have specific worries about your boy? And, and no, no, nothing at all. I mean, I, I still monitor what he does, so yeah. I don't have a problem with it. But um, what, every single thing? Yeah. Okay. Because he's, uh, he's of an age. I told him I'd do it. He, he, he ain't got a problem with it. He's 14 at the moment. Can't he, um, go, um, can't he go on incognito? Unless he's listening to this, he probably doesn't know it exists. Oh, shut up, Colin. Seriously? How old well, is he, he now? He does. It doesn't matter. Incognito is not incognito anyway. It's just what they tell you. No, it's more incognito than not cognito. It's more incognito than cognito, Col. To most parents, it would be, yes. But I, I, you can still find out what they visited. And I'd still get a log of it because of what I've set up on it anyway. What? So it wouldn't matter. <laughs> what? I'd get a log of every website that he visits. Because you've put different software onto his phone? Yeah. Okay. And I, everyone could do that. I didn't know that. I've checked, actually. Eleanor checked. I, I didn't doubt you for a minute, but yeah, Google's in... I've been mean, crikey. 13-year-old gets a little message at, at, at 13th birthday saying, right, tell your dad to sling his hook. I, I'm in charge. <laughs> I'm the daddy now. It's, it's, it's a little Ray Winston reference. Colin, thank you. This is what I mean. I, you know, this is what I mean. It's the more you talk about it. Do you see what I mean now? Because I bet if you haven't heard us have one of these conversations before... 
Look, Michelle Donnellan appears to be a bit daft, thinking that you can just ban children from buying phones. Like That's going to make the blindest bit of difference because children don't currently buy their own phones. But if you thought, as I did, when Brianna Jai started calling for a ban on social media access for under 16s, you thought, oh, I, and I don't mean that, I, maybe it is a bit patronising, but you thought from a place of pity, concern and compassion, you thought, oh, bless you, but you're on a hiding to nothing. I don't think she is. And, and I mean, Colin's just crystallised it still further. You only need to get two people in the room, Mr. Apple and Mr. Google, and tell them that if they don't do this now, and we won't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, there'll be flaws in it, and there'll be parents that sign their children up for it, just as there are parents that used to show their kids porn. You know, let them have a borrow of their copy of Mayfair or whatever it was. Um, there'll always be parents that, that go against the general consensus. But you tell Mr. Google and Mr. Apple that if they don't do this, then you'll hit them where it hurts. And that, it only hurts in one place for those people. It only hurts in one place. And that's the wallet. Speaking of which, how much money do you think The Sun has lost in the last 12 months or so? The Sun newspaper, R Rupert Murdoch's. Um, flagship title. I, I, I shall tell you a little later this hour. But first, Martin is in Tewkesbury. Martin, what would you like to say? Uh, I'm, I'm horrified by the discussion because I think of naivety is, is absolutely shocking. I mean, the previous guy, the IT guy, I mean, the level of, of, of intrusion and lack of privacy for his son, I think is absolutely appalling. For his 12-year-old um, son? Yeah, and, 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 and all the... Well, well, I, I, I mean, I mean, what you should, I mean, the only way to protect your children is through education and and and, and, and transparency and openness with, them. Um, and so they trust you. And the fact is that, that 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 trying to control access or monitor access, I mean, I think is deeply dangerous. Um, I mean, I think moving on to the sort of technical side of it, I, I'm not sure anyone yet has mentioned the acronym VPN, Virtual Private Networks. So the fact is that... Well, no, that, but that we, we've acknowledged, to... I mean, literally in the moments before you came on air, we acknowledge the existence of technological loopholes which would allow, allow people to bypass whatever prohibitions were put in place. But but let's let's back up a little bit. Well, the The... the um, simple question of, of keeping an eye on what children are doing and, and not allowing them complete freedom to do stuff. That sounds a bit strange. I, 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 I don't think you can. Well, well, then why, why is it illegal for them should, to buy cigarettes? Can. Why is it illegal for them to buy cigarettes and alcohol then? I think that's a, I think that's a separate issue. Well, you have to you say can, that you now, but you need, you need to answer it. the question. Why is it illegal for them well, to do it? And why is it monitored? Well, well, they're physical things, don't they? I think the point about, so I mean, the the phone. Point about, about access so to the information... So is a phone. The phone's a well, physical a phone thing. Is, yeah. Well, a phone... So why well, is it yeah, different? But, but, so why, is, but why is it different? I mean, we could just educate them instead. It well, could well, still be legal. It's all about educating them, isn't it? We don't need to have laws in place. We don't have to infringe their privacy or their freedom. We could, they could free to buy alcohol and cigarettes, but hopefully, you know, we'll just educate them not to. What's the difference? Well, well, I, I think the point is, is, is there is no point putting in place laws which, 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 which is designed to, fail, which stand no chance of success. So, but they would, they'd, said, they'd stand huge chances of success. Well, well, if if you believe that stopping people buying phones, I mean, or children buying phones, no, I don't think that would work. I don't think that would work. I think banning under sixteen-year-olds from social media in the same way that under eighteen-year-olds can't get can't get onto gambling websites would would be a good but, but idea. Can't do that, can you? Because all someone has to do is use a VPN. My, as I say, my boys were using VPNs from eleven or twelve, and immediately you circumvent whatever UK the laws. Technology is the technology is already caught up with that. Netflix can spot VPNs. Well, it can maybe spot them, but what it does, what, close them what, down. What, what, what the, close down the account well, that's been set up on a VPN. Netflix can already do it. And you know, and I know that this is this is simply the case of occasionally the loophole gets out there before the. People who've got the biggest budgets in the world have, have caught up with it, but they close it down incredibly quickly. But, but why do films? Why do films? Floor. Why do films have age ratings? Do you think? What, but, but VPNs are not a loophole, are they? They're fundamental to daily life. When you access your banking account, you're doing it through your means. Yes, but if, if you're mis VPN if you're misrepresenting yourself uh, to a provider of a service online, they can put measures in place to prevent you from doing so. So, to, so, so, gambling. Let's talk about gambling websites. How do they work? How do you manage to stop eighteen-year-olds from getting on a gambling website? 
Well, but there you have to pay for something, don't you? So what you no, have is authentication. No, you don't. No, you, don't, you, don't. Is, you don't have to pay for something. You open the account before you put any money in it, obviously. But you can't gamble, though, can you? If, even if you can open an account. Of course you, of course you can. And, and the point is that... You can nick your dad's credit card. How can you card. gamble if you have... If, if, well, well, okay, but that, but that applies to anything else as well, doesn't it's it? Got, if, a few texts here saying, this, this, this caller doesn't understand what a VPN is. I certainly do understand what a VPN okay. is, and VPNs are either free or chargeable. I mean, so I mean, the point is, you you can represent yourself as being. <laughs> Richard says, being, "God, being, ask him. You voted Brexit. You voted Brexit, didn't you? That's very unfair. But does, but why can't we do on social Sorry, media? Me? Why can't we do on social media companies <laughs> what, what what we do on gambling companies? Just just in an, in a sentence. I, I'm an absolute. I, I'm an absolute remain. I mean, <laughs> just answer the bloody question. Why can't we do on Facebook what we do on gambling companies? Because it won't work. It can't But it work. works on gambling so, companies! But all the, all the all privacy right. pr campaigners are against this, aren't they? What, what They're do you mean all it. the privacy campaigners are against if you it? Look, well, if you look at the online safety bill, all the things that flow from that, all the privacy campaigners are against it. I, I, you've what lost you me. have is... I, I don't know what you're talking about, which is not... It's, I'm relation, sure that's my in fault. Relation not... to authentic, in relation to authentication. In relation to authentication and... Well, who, and who are and the privacy... Actors. When you say all the privacy campaigners, who do you mean? Um, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Alec, Alec Muffet is one of them again. Who are you talking about? These, I, we did just, anyway, I, maybe you're right. Maybe you've got a more powerful point than I've managed to appreciate, in which case I apologise. And I do want people, and now I've just monstered old Martin when he's rung in to offer up an alternative view, so now nobody else will, and you'll accuse me of being biased and one-sided, and you might even have a point, but... If you can do it on a, on a on, if Paddy Power can do it, why can't Facebook? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Katie's in Birmingham. Katie, what do you reckon? Hi James. Hello, so Katie. when when my eleven year old went to secondary school, I was determined I didn't want to put a smartphone into the hands of an eleven year old. So I got him one of those old style phones you were just talking about with the previous caller. Yeah. I got him one of those two G network. You could text on it. Did it have so snake on it? He had snake, he loved oh, snake. Oh, happy days, so, happy days. You know, he'd, he'd never had a phone before, so he just thought it was marvellous. He'd got this phone, he was safe going to and from school, he could text me when he got to school, he could ring me if he needed to, I knew he was safe. The battery lasted about a week, yep. it cost me next to nothing for the actual phone, and there, of course no data to, to pay for, so what wasn't to like? Interestingly, they did a survey at school of all the kids who, when they arrived at school, and presented the results to the parents, which is really good, keeping us all informed about what was going on. He was the only child in his year that didn't have a smartphone, and there was no child in the year that had no phone. So yeah. he was the only one. Was he ostracised? Well, he was he, wasn't, Did actually. they flush I mean, his head down the toilet every Tuesday morning? No, thank Thankfully not, and he's the sort of kid who didn't he didn't really care about having a rubbish phone, thankfully. My Good other child him. probably would have been bothered. Uh. But the point was, we, we ended up having to abandon that in right. the end for a number of reasons. Um, well, firstly, all the other parents had that option available to them to get their kid an on-smartphone, and nobody took it. So I think there's a, definitely an element of parental education here. But we live through our... We, li we live through... I'm terrible at this. I don't... Do you remember? I don't know which, whether you had this, but if I needed a new cricket bat, I always try and get my dad to take me, which was hard because dad's job took him away a lot. And, he, he, you know, if mum took me, I'd get I'd get the one that came free with a tin of Castrol GTX. But dad yeah. always wanted me to have good stuff. And, yeah. and, I, yeah. and, and that I think we do that with phones, don't we? We want our kids. to. I mean, you didn't, obviously, but I think a lot of parents just want their kids to have the good stuff. They do, but then I think there's I think there's um, a room for a sort of semi a sort of teenage phone. I think the phone, if parental power was there and purchasing power was there to say we want our kids to have a nice phone because his was a bit rubbish to be yeah, honest. Yeah. Um, but is there a version of the phone that could be restricted and locked down in some way? Because the other thing I couldn't do on that phone is I couldn't put the tracker apps on it, and there were various things that I would have liked to be able to do on that phone. I, 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 I think it's chicken and egg. I, I think it's going to be getting the social media companies to police the age of people getting online rather than yeah. changing the nature of the technology in their pocket. And then as a parent, you might say, well, look, if you're not using it, so there's some stuff you can use it for, like, I mean, good games, much as I enjoyed Snake. 
it's not exactly Call of Duty, is no. it? It's, it's, no. it's not exactly up there with Angry Birds or whatever else it might be now. Um, you, 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 you get it. You get it from from the other end. How, how did he change? Did he did he fall into any rabbit holes when he got his smartphone during COVID? Um, well, he no, he didn't Good. actually. He was, re- but then I, I'm afraid I was pretty um, hard line on it, and I took it away and locked it all down did and you? restricted all the apps that he could have access to and all that kind of stuff. So on an iPhone, you, you can't do that remotely, but you can do it through parental controls and sort of lock, lock it down. Um, so even now, he's 16 now, um, and even now it's pretty locked down. It goes off automatically at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, it doesn't come on until 7 in the morning. Um, so I've got all of those things locked down, and he's pretty compliant, to be fair. I like it. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we could all do more stuff like that if we had the tools and the knowledge to do it. Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, this is from Will. Uh, he, he makes a very valid point. You will be posting your show onto YouTube later. Well, actually, Will, I think you'll find I've got people to do that. You will be on Twitter later. I'm on Twitter now, mate. What's your point? Uh, you said yesterday that you want to be more active on threads and Instagram. Yeah, I didn't mean it, though. I, I, seriously, I'm far too busy as it is. Social media is crucial to your work, yet you want to tell children it's too dangerous for them to use until they are 16. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. what's the problem with that? What's the big zinger that I'm missing here? It seems perfectly... There's lots of things that's going... Mean, you know, driving a tube train is crucial to my work, but I wouldn't want 14-year-olds to be doing it tomorrow, Will. I don't know quite. I don't know quite what the point is you think you've made, but I'm confident I've almost certainly missed it. Here's Amelia Cox with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 33 minutes after 12. I, I wouldn't normally do this, but I, you know, I, I'm not entirely comfortable with the word Karen as a as a criticism. Sheila gets very exercised by it, and I fully understand why because there's not really a male equivalent, or at least. There's not a male equivalent I could say on the radio because we had this conversation yesterday because Karen was one of the answers in the New York Times crossword. Uh, you know, it's used as a as a as a, as a um, pejorative for a, usually a white woman complaining about something. Not always white, but it, it, it's usually I think it propped up with white women complaining about black people just living or existing or being in their apartment block, even though they lived there as well. And and I, and I said to, to Eleanor. I said, of course there's a word for a male Karen, that, and that word is, and then I used a fairly uh, strong Anglo-Saxon word, and we go, oh yes, there is, there is a male equivalent of that, you wouldn't really call a word. Anyway, I digress slightly. Is there a word for someone that rings a radio show and has to speak to the producer before they get onto the radio programme proper, you know, before they get to really see the rabbit, and says to them, with a straight face, as someone just did to Eleanor, with all due respect... I think my hourly rate is much higher than yours. What word would you use for a man who said, is there a word for that kind of thing? No, you can't say that on the radio, Keith. Is, is, there like a, is there an equivalent of a Karen for someone who rings in and dares to speak to Roxy or to Eleanor in such a patronising and condescending fashion and is too thick to realise, whatever their hourly rate may be, that insulting them is insulting me and m- minimises to the point of complete disappearance? the possibility of you getting anywhere near air. With all due respect, I think my hourly... Well, with all due respect to you, pal, I think my hourly rate is probably considerably greater than yours, but saying something like that out loud makes you a prat, whatever your pay packet looks like. 12.35 is the time. Harry's in Ealing. Harry, steer us back to a sensible conversation, please, and, and, and leave your hourly pay rate out of it. I don't think my hourly pay rate is even near to yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, obviously, I was listening to one of your um, last callers. Uh, I think it was Colin. Yeah. I think it was before. He made sense. Obviously, I do the same thing. I'm 36. I've got a 14-year-old child um, where I've restricted him on social media. He doesn't have a social media account, doesn't have Instagram, doesn't have Facebook. He has WhatsApp, where yep. he's under monitored, uh, which is on a tablet, which I have access to on my phone. Because obviously I use the web version of WhatsApp to see what he's doing if he's messaging random people out the blue. Um, In his school, which is in Acton, um, which is very well maintained how how they do with mobile phones, they're not they don't allow uh, smart devices. Well, in the whole, so you can't bring one into school. You can't bring it in school. You bring it into school. It gets confiscated, and then obviously the parents, obviously myself, will be notified and informed and saying, right, your child has brought in a smart device. 
this so is what, 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 what do they normally do? Take in a non-smart device or, yeah, so or leave their as, smart devices at home? What, what's the as general? our old generation, how we work here, we bring a brick phone. So otherwise, yeah. or otherwise known as a drug dealer phone, should I say. Um, but it's a, just a standard phone okay. that can text, that can uh, call, and that's about it. That's how it's supposed to be. Now, right now, my kid's at home. It's okay. Easter holidays. It is. He's on the PlayStation, but it's monitored. So right. I have access it onto my phone. So there's a new message. I can see it. If there's anything else, I can see it. Wow. Well. This is the first time he's ever had a PlayStation in the last five months. He's never had one before. He's never had a console before. So he, for the 14, let's just say he's 14 and never had a console until now. Why? Because I don't like how social media has been portrayed. Well, right but now, you can I, play on your you can play video games without going on social media. You can, you play, can play. You can play it. Yeah. It's, it's non it's non internet accessible consoles. Yeah. So I've given. So he's him had that my, then. So you mean you've let him can, online on 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 his games? Not online. So he, until so he, he was fourteen, he, he wasn't allowed to play any video games. He he could play video games as a standard basic, so mobile phone games, uh, right. like. Um, um, I, 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 I mean, there's slight elements of this that are part of a different conversation. But it, it, and, and I ask this question in in all seriousness: what 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 are you worried about? Well, what are you protecting work, him from? I have seen this in my workplace. Yes. I actually work in the justice system under the YOI, so the Youth Offenders Institute. And I have seen it from age 14 up to 18 who have gone on social media to get zombie knives easily accessible. And I have seen yeah, people... There's a have, million people on social media who've never been anywhere near a zombie knife. Yeah, but then they've been near enough to a person who has... Does your sexual do, do, ask, uh, under sexual context? Yeah, I, but again, the massive majority of people on there have... I mean, I've been on it for t 20 years. It's never happened to me. No, but you have to think about it from the are old you particularly generation worried? Generation. Are you particularly worried about your boy? Do you think he's impressionable? No, I, or? I, to, to me, my kid, I always yeah. say he's too honest for his own good. Okay, so you are a little bit worried about his naivety. Yeah, I, okay, I believe bless that you, one man. way or another, he's going to be to the point that someone's going to end up giving him something or doing okay. something. Or asking I'm so him glad something. I asked that before I went off on one about you. No, 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 no. No, because you, you, no one, I mean, most, most of us would attest that no one knows our children as well as I do. And I think I my, my dad would probably my dad would probably have talked about me like exactly. you're talking about your if boy. If you don't moment. believe that your kid's going to be naive and uh, believe any uh, not going to believe anything, you're deluded. Yeah. That's well, up to I a point. Let's not, I mean, let's sit in judgment on others because I'm, I'm encouraging yeah. people not to sit in judgment on you. But where no, does it end, Harry? Where does it end? It does, it does, the problem is it yeah. will never end. Well, it, of course it, it will. will. He's going to he's gonna leave home one day. He's going to get married. He's, you're not, you're not going to be there when he's Yeah, you but know, then you still got his next generation. The next, but you're only talking about one person out of thousands. Yeah. It's going to carry on going. The next generation is going to carry on going. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Right now, generations are getting much, much worse than what our generation... Well, they, they, they are, you they are remember, and you're at the you're at the forefront of it. Given what you do, you're you work in a youth offenders institution. For example, but, but, yeah, go on. For example, back in the day when we were kids, if we did something bad, our dads would literally give us the backhand. Well, that's, that's child just, abuse, <laughs> though. Well, that time it wasn't. It was either you were well, going to get. I know, but don't spoil it because we just reached no, the kind. Well, well, you I'm are spoiling it a bit. No, you not. You can't sit here saying back. You, I mean, are you, are you suggesting no, no, no. that was a I'm good just thing? Saying, no, I'm just saying there That's is just there an illustration sort of, of how much things have changed. No, things have changed where there's nothing around for anyone anymore. There is nothing around for the new generation or the now current generation of kids. Well, not in, not in your son's around. case because you don't let him anywhere near it. But everyone else is having the time of their life playing FIFA 24 and and and, okay. and, and various other video games and and loads of other technological based uh, amusements and delights. But then you're seeing it from another point of view. You're seeing it from that point of view. Okay, right. No, mate. I'm just counting. Media. You said there's nothing oh, to no, do, no, so I just gave you a long then, list of things that most kids can do, but your kid but can't. Those kids are going outside wearing a hood rich top. Right. Around, yeah. Okay. It's all gone a little bit weird now because I mean, th th there's plenty of children not what whatever brand it is you just alluded to. There's plenty of children not doing those things and not buying zombie knives, and not engaging in inappropriate sexual behaviour online. And uh, there, there is an element. I've, I'm going to say this to you actually, rather rather than. Um, not offer you the chance to respond. A lot of people listening to this will think you sound very paranoid. 
Have you actually seen it from the other side of the room? No, you've called other people delusion, so they're calling you paranoid. Of course these risks exist, but you sound paranoid. Paranoid, because I've seen the other side. I'm, no, actually, I know, but I'm you sound paranoid. I don't sound paranoid. No, you do, you do, because I'm telling you what you sound like, because I'm, I'm listening, you sound paranoid. You can class it as paranoia. You yes. can class it as anything like that. But the thing is, I'm overprotected as a kid, as a child, to my child. Yeah. And obviously, I'm. Uh, and when I'm seeing it from the youth offender side, yeah. where I see kids who have no clue about why they even had a product or why they've gone on social media to do certain things, it's well, because they you were can't influenced. you just educate him? What part of education system is showing that? No, you. What, you educate safety? him. But then also, what is is showed in the, in a school? Internet safety. No, okay. you, you educate him, especially with your professional experience. You literally sit him down and talk him through all always, the risks that you're just... I will always do it, but then you've got pro- people who can't do it because they don't know anything but about it. I'm talking it. about you! Why no, don't you I'm do it? Me. I yes. am doing it. That's why my kid doesn't do it. No, he doesn't my do it because he's not allowed. This is, this is one of the most surreal conversations I've ever had at 12.43 on a Wednesday. He's, your kid's <laughs> not doing it because he's not allowed to. So There's loads and loads of kids out there not, do not like doing it because they don't want to or because they understand the risks. Why is yeah, your then child... They don't understand the risk. Yeah, you, I, I, look, they I give don't up. understand the risk until they actually see what the risk has happened. Well, the but that's not true, scenario. is it? Because the, the world is full of people that don't do things because they understand the risks. Is it? Are you sure? Because I'm, right now, uh, yes, I'm we're the population I, no, of I'm positive it is. under four, uh, from fifteen. To, uh, sorry, and the massive majority of teenagers are not involved in knife crime. But compared to the massive amount of, uh, of a percentage, I don't, mate, we can't argue about the meaning of the word majority, and, and we can't argue about the meaning of the word paranoid, and we can't argue about the meaning of of, of the words overprotective, which you're comfortable with, and so we will, I think. Leave it at that. But, I, I, I mean, crikey, I, I just as someone a little bit further down the road of life than you, uh, the kids I was at school with whose parents didn't let them do anything at all were the ones that went absolutely crackerjack when they went away to college. Um, and, in fact, the kids I was at college with who went absolutely crackerjack were the ones who'd had the... I mean, partly boarding school, actually, would be some of them, where you couldn't do any of the things that children at normal schools could do so they'd go off uh, on, on so that's all that's um that's just just a, a little word of um uh, observation and as tom says just because you're paranoid doesn't mean that they're not out to get you uh thank you harry asha's in hendon asha what would you like to say Hi. hello Hi. Asha. oh my god that's a long call you I had tell you, a long i tell you what it was a, i think it felt a lot longer than it was actually asha yeah, but okay. on you go um if, yeah i oh, it's so difficult isn't it because i think you're you're right on what you just said in your last comment if you keep them too sheltered and too you know you're too strict it can also go the other way tell me about um it. but i do also agree with what a lot of your previous callers have said so you have to it's just trying to find that balance and i've only got one child so i've got no previous experience i've got no idea what i'm doing half the time yeah you do and it, it's really difficult because so my daughter turned 11 last summer and she was going to start high school in september i got her a smartphone she'd been asking for ages and i had my old phone i upgraded so i thought okay give her my old phone and it's quite good because the battery keeps running out so that's nice. Um, so she's got the, the phone. It's a smartphone. Got a number and everything. Um, and one of your previous callers, um, sorry, also said about this Google thing, which is brilliant. Um, and have you used that? Have you signed up yeah, to it? Yeah, Do you know, yeah, it's different yeah, in every yeah, country. It's, it's, di- it's different it's in every country. So what? What? I mean. I think when you talk about how difficult it is to get it right, you, you kind of want the decision taken away from you. If your children were literally not allowed to have access to social media until they were 16, they can't even blame you for it, Asha. Yeah, so that's what that's what I think. But if it was there, it would be so easy to say to her, you're not allowed. I mean, I do... She has... The only thing she's got on her phone at the moment is WhatsApp and everything else... I've that's pretty... Well, WhatsApp well, well, can be tricky, can't know, it? Because you, you don't know. get invited into groups or you can yeah, see but that... Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, it's because I kind of, I check, I don't know if this is a good thing to admit, but I do check her phone all the time. I check her messages, I read her messages. She's got an email, which she never She's 11. I think that's absolutely fine. I, I, I fact, read everything. But some of the, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how It sounds long, to me you're doing everything right. Congratulations. Well, how long Have a do gold you keep star. doing that? How like, long do you keep doing 24. that? 24. When, when she's 13 or 20, 14, 24. I don't know what's going to 24. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> 24 and a half if they're particularly if they're particularly immature 24 and a half yeah. that's it you can't do anything my mum still yeah. checks my messages when I go home when I go back to yeah, Kidderminster for the weekend will. I catch up going through my messages thank you Asha for a little bit of much needed light relief now it's time for one of our regular features that we thought were brilliant ideas when we came up with the idea and then completely and then completely forgot about but are now briefly remembering and this is two in two days because the it's the gift that keeps on get that it's the gift that keeps on um giving unhinged headline and once again our gratitude to alison pearson of the daily telegraph for this humdinger of an unhinged headline and I never, I never make these up. I have to check, actually. They've changed it now because I think they probably were worried about getting an unhinged headline. But I've got the original in front of me. And the original unhinged headline is, The NHS is killing us. It is an enemy of Britain. Unhinged headline. Uh, I've got the First Minister of Wales waiting outside the studio under the impression that he's coming on a serious grown-up conversational programme about politics and, and, and sundry other mature issues. Um, Vaughan Gething, uh, the First Minister of Wales and the leader of Welsh Labour, with me after this. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.51 is the time. Vaughan Gething is the name, the first... Uh, well, the, the new leader of Welsh Labour and, of course, the First Minister of Wales as a consequence of that job. Um, thank you for coming in, Vaughan. Lovely to meet you, James. Likewise. Well, I gather your brother is a big fan. I digress. I digress. He is a fan. <laughs> He's a chef in Copenhagen. He'll be delighted <laughs> to have got a mention as pathetic, well. pathetic, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> Why did you want the job? Because I think it's a job where you can really change the future of the country. And that's the whole point. When I joined the Labour Party at the age of 70, you know, I wanted to be part of something that would change the country for the better. Now I'm elected and it's all about the difference you can make. You get loads of problems and challenges in the job. There are loads of opportunities as well. And I'm ambitious and hopeful for the future of the country. And we don't have a reset moment in Wales, we'll get an opportunity, I hope, after a general election to reset the future of Wales and Britain together. When do you think the election will be? My working assumption is it'll be in the autumn, but who knows? There could be an implosion before then, or the Tories could decide to go really deep and annoy everyone with a winter election. But whenever it comes, we'll be ready in Wales, and I'm very keen to make the case for an alternative future, as I say, for Wales and Britain. Um, what's at the top of your to-do list, as opposed to your in-tray, in terms of the, the things that you want to do versus the things that you have to do? What's at the top of your to-do, your, your, your kind of wish list? I want to see a better economic future for my country, one that takes advantage of our enormous economic potential in renewable energy as well as our big areas of strength so we got advanced manufacturing semiconductors and more and i want my country to be fairer and i think we can do that by giving younger people an opportunity to plan a more successful future in wales and i think in some of that we need a bit more self-confidence about ourselves what i think we're too that? apologetic really yeah, I think in Wales we're not good enough at talking about the things we do really well, to have more confidence about who we are and about what we can do. So I think ambition is really important for the country. Who, who, would, who could you learn from in that field? Who, who do you have in mind when you sort of think they're getting it right and we're getting it wrong? Well, even if you look at where, where Ireland was 50 years ago compared to where it is now, mm. people are really proud to be Irish. And the view of the world about Ireland, I think, is different now as well. I just think that if you're not prepared to tell your own story, you can't rely on the rest of the world to do it for you. Well, I, I guess your political opponents are keen to tell parts of the current story of Wales. And uh, as the election, whenever it occurs, approaches, they'll be hitting these notes again and again and again. And I'm thinking of the uh, some of the devolved areas of government, health and education in particular, that the Welsh Health Service routinely described as performing worse than the, the English. I think the Prime Minister was jumping on that point on LBC earlier this morning. Do we know why? Well, there's always a desire to have a go at Wales, to not... No, no, I don't mean why are they having a go at Wales. I mean, why is the Welsh Health Service uh, underperforming even the English one? No, well, actually, on a whole range of areas, we're doing better than the English Health Service. So it, it's never um, an entirely honest... Um, 
conversation around what is happening. And the politics are very obvious about why the Tories want to have a go. We know that we have an older population in Wales, a population that has more healthcare challenges. So actually, it means we've got more need to deal with. What we actually need is some stability and investment in the future of public services. And to do that, we've also got to grow the economy. We could also do, frankly, um, with a better relationship between governments in the UK. So we don't have the UK government constantly looking to take powers and money away from devolved governments where it doesn't win elections. I think that future is possible. Be good for Wales and good for Britain as well. How, how um, high does the Welsh independence movement beep on your political radar? How, 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 how big an issue is it in domestic Welsh politics? It's not a big issue. There are obviously, Plaid Cymru is a party that is committed to independence. But actually, when it comes to the main concerns of voters, that isn't it. I think the Tories have done a good job in promoting independence an issue with what's happened in the last five years in particular. But if you talk to voters in Wales about their main concerns, they're interested in the cost of living crisis, the tax burden, the future of public services. They're desperately unhappy about the current UK government and a feeling of hopelessness about where they are. We need to not just say the Tories are awful. We've got to provide a better future and I think genuinely having two Labour governments uh, working for Wales and Britain will be, a, well, I said, good news for us. And I think that speaks to where voters really are. Um, it, it was a tight race, wasn't it? Let me, I'm sure you've seen what Richard Wynne-Jones, yeah. the professor of Welsh politics at Cardiff University, had to say about the, the leadership battle where you prevailed. He described it as a very, very difficult result for the Labour Party, a very unhappy contest. And he described a very widespread feeling among your opponents that you had basically bought your way to the leadership. This after you, you, you received uh, some hefty donations mm -hmm. for, from a firm run by a man convicted of environmental offences. Uh, I don't think Richard is an expert on the Labour Party. Um, I quite like Richard, actually, but I regularly think he gets the Labour Party wrong. And actually, it's a one-member, one-vote election. Uh, and that means not only have I won, but I've got a government that brings together people who supported different candidates. The party is in a really good place and we're all committed to the future. That's about the next two years of the Senate before our elections and really course, importantly, yes. the coming months in the run up to a general election. And in the leadership contest itself, there was lots of agreement between myself and my opponent on priorities for the country and what we wanted to do and a recognition that having a UK Labour government was essential to so much what we think we can do for the future of Wales. Um, you don't speak Welsh. Are you the first First Minister not to speak Welsh? Indeed, doing dusky Cymraeg, so I'm learning. No, that's no, I could uh, say that. Uh, <laughs> no, doing doing dusky, doing Shada Tippenbach. I've, okay, I've well been done. taking lessons, and I'll carry on taking lessons. And actually, I think for people in Wales, seeing someone who isn't fluent in the language is still learning an office. I think it's really positive. For the language to have a future, to have a million speakers, we need more people like me who are learning the language, thinking about how to use it and how to use more of it in everyday life. So I'm looking forward to trying out even more of my developing Welsh language skills in the future. Um, I, I, I'm going to mention the fact that you are the first black leader of a, of a devolved nation and, and, and indeed the first um, black, black person to, to hold a, a, a variety of positions. I'd like, as I'm sure you would as well, to live in a world where that wasn't worth mentioning or where that wasn't important. But, but I mention it because I'd like you to tell us a little about the trip you made to Birmingham, Alabama last September to represent Wales at the 60th anniversary of that, that racist bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church where, where four black girls were killed. Why, why, why did you go there and what was it like? So we were invited to attend and to take part in the service, which was a really big honour. It's an enormous event because when the Ku Klux Klan bombed that church and killed the four little girls, there was enormous damage done, including blowing out one of the main windows. Now, now there's now the Wales window because people in Wales gave money in a widespread appeal. People gave pocket money to create this window. It's now a depiction of um, a black Christ in a crucifixion. And it's enormous as well. You know, it's the size of two big double doors. And when you're in the pulpit, it's there directly ahead of you on the first floor. And they said before I spoke... Um, 
We're going to hear from the people of Wales to remark the solidarity they showed. It's the only practical mark of solidarity from a different part of the world after that outrage had taken place. So to have the honour to stand up in front of those people, I have Spike Lee in my ear um, cheering and applauding when I was listening to everyone else, and then to get up and speak. And I can tell you, in a room where I stood up to speak from Wales, there was an audible intake of breath when somebody like me stood up and spoke for Wales. So it's still the fact that people have different views about who you are and where you're from. And I hope getting through that, we do get to a world where we recognise where we come from, the things we got wrong, but we put more of that right. So it really is the content of your character that judges where you go in life. We're not there yet. That rings a bell. Final question. What's, What's the worst thing about the new job? Oh, not having enough time with the family. It's always okay. the balance. Yeah. It's always the balance. You know, my boy's still in primary school. You know, as long as my wife still wants to talk to me, it's a good thing I'd like to see her as well. Balancing all of those things is the most difficult thing. But I think it's also, in many ways, the most important thing to maintain a grip on reality in those precious moments of normality that I think both give you resilience, um, but also some balance about why you're doing this job and making all those compromises. Um, but yeah big opportunities and I'm very much looking forward uh, to what we can do and still being someone who's a proud husband and dad through that. And next time I see you, you'll be fluent in Welsh. Uh, perhaps <coughs> not, but I'll be able to speak even more. But Va- you can test your Welsh on me then as well. I will after we just say goodbye. That's it from me for another day. Vaughan Gething, many thanks to the First Minister of Wales and the leader, of course, of Welsh Labour. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the, player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. James O'Brien on LBC.